about being a reviewer is sometimes you have to do things that you really don't want to do. This series, how can I say? I have what can be described as a love-hate relationship. On one hand, I met some very good friends talking about this series every week, but I hate what it became. As I look back and read the whole series from beginning to end, where did it go wrong? At what point can I definitely point at and say, this was the beginning of the end? Well, perhaps I can find the answer. Here's the thing. I can forgive a lot. I can forgive plot holes. I can forgive bad writing. And God help me, I can even overlook ass bowls. If in the end, I smile at the end of the story. All I ask is that I'm happy I watched or read the series. That I can look back on it with fond memories. But when Naruto's final page hit, I can safely tell you one thing. I was not smiling. That's not to say the series did badly financially. Unlike, say, Bleach, which fell off the top sales and into obscurity, Naruto's sales were fairly steady. Of course, that meant even after the series ended, they were going to continue it, and that's where Boruto comes into play. Now, for the record, no, I have not seen Boruto, I am not interested in watching it, the way Naruto concluded didn't exactly encourage me to follow any sequels. I've heard varying stories about how well it's doing. Some say it's doing very well and some say it's doing very poorly. Me? Don't know and don't care. I simply am not interested in it either way. So this series will most likely not cover anything from Boruto. Also, a little disclaimer, I'm doing this sub-series on my own time because I have very, very personal reasons for doing so, but we'll get into that later. To first understand why Naruto fell from grace, we must first see why it drew praise to begin with. After all, while this is a rise and fall of Naruto, it's just as in many ways a rise and fall of Masashi Kishimoto, the series offer. Masashi Kishimoto is a hard nut to crack. From what I can find, I know that in 1999, he was a struggling mangaka trying to have a breakthrough series. It wasn't until he worked with his then-editor Sosuke Yahagi that Kishimoto was able to find success. A series about a young boy was pitched. I know there were certain pitches that didn't make the cut, but eventually it became a story about a boy trying to become a ninja. However, Kishimoto hit a snag. The story fell to a crawl, so his editor suggested that he give his main character a rival who would push Naruto. From then, it became easy to plot the story, and a heroine was added to fill the gap. The story begins in the Hidden Leaf Village, or Konoha if you prefer. Konoha is one of the five major hidden villages in the Shinobi world. The third Hokage serves as the head of the village. Narration tells us of how the fourth Hokage sealed away the Nine Tails Demon Fox, or QB if you will. We meet a young boy named Yuzumaki Naruto, who is a troublemaker. He doesn't have a family, but he has one supporter in the name of his teacher, Iruka. We see that Naruto is a very lonely boy. He doesn't have a family to go home to. Through some shenanigans, Naruto ends up stealing the secret scroll that tells of a secret technique. Iruka finds Naruto first, but Mizuki appears and tells Naruto the real truth. He is the nine-tailed demon fox. This almost breaks Naruto, but Iruka wins Naruto with an impassioned speech, and it's a fine introduction to Naruto's character. He's a troublemaker, but we also see why he felt that way and why it was so easy to sympathize with him. The other two main characters are introduced quickly and informally by comparison. First up is Haruno Sakura, a pink-haired girl who Naruto has a crush on, but she in turn has a crush on his rival, Uchiha Sasuke, who... I'm gonna be blunt. I really don't like this kid. Anything that goes wrong with the series, and I guarantee you that this kid is one of the reasons. So basically we have the relationship set up and we see how it impacts them. There's a love triangle there, and it's not very well resolved in the end, but that shipping talk, and I'm not getting into that just yet. I'll have plenty of feelings on how it was all handled, but I'll be keeping quiet for now. They meet their sensei, Ataki Kakashi, who I will have some strong words for later on. For now, though, he does have a cool introduction, and he does set the tone well when he tells his students that, really, at the end of the day, while they may do cool things, people do die. Team 7, as they are coined, are completely unable to work together, and it is Sasuke who makes that decision to do so. The beginning arc, The Land of the Waves, gives us a chance to see what these characters can do. The action is really tight, and Zabuza is a great villain. But he also has some depth of his relationship with Haku, a young, very effeminate boy. There really was a grit to the fight scenes this early on that sadly became lost as time went on. This arc, we do start to see the beginnings of Naruto and Sasuke beginning their bond, but sadly, this is all we would get. 
It's a good beginning, but it's not enough. However, the ending where they name the bridge after Naruto is a nice moment because it feels earned. Unfortunately, this next decision would prove to be to the series' detriment. Instead of showing Team 7 going on their missions and gradually becoming friends, we are only told they were going on missions. We really needed some smaller arcs that focused more on them getting to know each other. Which, apparently, Kishimoto wanted to do, but his editor said no. This will become a reoccurring problem. We are then introduced to more characters, which include the other teams of Konoha, who, to be honest, don't really get much screen time later on, unless your name is Shikamaru. We are also introduced to Gara, who as time goes on, we proceed to learn is basically Naruto without having Aruka to look after him. What's great about this arc is that we are introduced to various conflicts that all add to a bigger story. Things like Neji's family drama, where he is cursed to give his life and can't escape his fate, the state of Gara and how poorly he was treated, and how Naruto and Sasuke are victims of not having parents. See, this arc is where we had themes of underdogs versus destiny, hard work versus naturally talented. Are those who have no bloodline cursed to become losers? According to this arc, the answer is no. You can change your destiny with hard work. This is a lesson that Kishimoto will sadly... break as time goes on. Of course, you can't talk about this arc without talking about Orochimaru. This guy is seriously creepy. He puts a seal on Sasuke that will come into play later. The first arc, we had a corrupt businessman as a villain. But with Orochimaru, we had a Macavillan schemer with a connection to the Hidden Leaf Village. It's why his confrontation with the third Hokage is so memorable. The third Hokage dies, but not without sealing Orochimaru's arms away. Orochimaru elevated the series, as now we had a reoccurring bad guy that would tempt one of the main characters to the dark side. The search for Sonate arc introduces us to Itachi, who really comes off as scary and intimidating here. Itachi serves as a reminder of what Sasuke could have become. The Uchiha massacre is set up as this big mystery. Why did Itachi murder his clan? Was it for power? Did he have an ulterior motive? Was he helped? All serve to remind us the dark secrets of the shinobi world. Itachi's arrival also serves as the introduction of the Akatsuki organization, who basically exists to remind us that despite Orochimaru being the primary villain, there is a far more sinister organization that our heroes will have to deal with. Having already met Jirai in the Chun exams, this is where we get introduced to Tsunade. This is where the series begins its themes of the previous generations, and how relationships repeat themselves throughout the series. Jiraiya is a hilarious character who has a good rapport with Naruto, and the legendary Sanyun's dynamic is similar to Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura's dynamic. However, I wonder if this would have happened, because according to an interview with Kishimoto after the series had ended, he wasn't sure how to end the Chunin exams, but was told by his editors to create a villain named Orochimaru to disrupt the tournament, which... Yeah, that puts a damper on things. But as long as we're talking about the theme of parallels... Naruto and Sasuke's journeys parallel each other. While Naruto is changing people with his way of never give up attitude, Sasuke is becoming a darker character. As Naruto grows stronger and stronger, Sasuke feels he is falling further and further behind. Thus sets up their duel in the Rescue Sasuke arc. You see, the thing about Naruto and Sasuke is that while they are very different from one another, they are very similar in many ways. They are two sides of a coin. Thus, their fight at the end manages to resonate because of how far both of them have come from the beginning, and when Sasuke leaves Naruto, you do feel the bond being broken. Now for a quick analysis of the main characters. We'll start with Naruto. Naruto is a little bit of a brat, but yet, as I said, we see why he does what he does. He wants acceptance. All he wants is to be acknowledged. While he is a little annoying at times, he has a good heart, and that's why so many people became gravitated to him. You want to see him win. He was the underdog. That's what made him so appealing. Basically, he's everything Sasuke is not. Where can I begin with Sasuke? As I said, I really don't like this kid. At this point in the series, he wasn't too bad. He was actually pretty bearable, mostly because when he was around Naruto, he had someone that gave him some volume outside of the brooding emo loner bit. His whole story is that he was born in the Prodigy, but then his aloof older brother slaughtered everyone he ever cared about, so you could still kinda sympathize with him. Unfortunately, as time goes on, Sasuke becomes a completely unbearable and unlikable character. Reasons I'll get into when the time is right. Sakura is... frustrating. I must admit I don't hate her the way so many other people do. She doesn't really have a good beginning, but we do see some positive attributes of her. It's hard to talk about Sakura without getting into shipping territory, and rest assured my thoughts on that whole fiasco will come. Not really looking forward to it because of the shitstorms that creates, but I have things I need to say. 
I will say this, her only real problem is her obsession with Sasuke. What she sees in the emo cunt, I will never know. There were times it seemed like he would save Sakura's character, but... <sighs> Not yet. Not yet. As for Kakashi, I have some words I'd like to say about him, but that'll be at the end. You see, part one holds up to me because at its core, it was a story about a boy trying to prove himself. It was a story about growing up. How all these kids were learning how to become adults, about how the world is not so ideal, but with a little luck and a little work, you can make a difference. The reason why Naruto became so popular is because Kishimoto did just enough to make you care about what his characters were going through. It's not about the fight scenes, it's not about how cool the jutsus are, it's about this. When Naruto gives the fourth Hokage a thumbs up, we do it with him. We want to see how this journey ends. So far, the journey has been worth it. And it never will be again. Kishimoto's series was a success. He went from a nobody to a superstar manga artist overnight. He was single when he started the manga, and in 2003 he got married and had kids. But he seemed to have a view that all the characters in Naruto were his children, and that just makes foreknowledge of some of the things that happened all the more sadder. That's part one. This was more of an introduction than anything else. As I continue reading through the series, I really dread what these videos are going to become. I'm really not looking forward to critiquing the war arc. These videos will be done on my own spare time. I have so many other projects to do, not to mention reading, taking notes of a manga chapter, writing the script. For better or for worse, I'm in for quite the ride. Before we begin, I feel a bit of clarification is necessary. You see, while Naruto is considered one of Shonen Jump's biggest hits ever, probably third behind Dragon Ball and One Piece, what I want to say is that despite its infamous reputation nowadays, it wasn't always like that. For the better part of a decade from 2000 to 2009, Naruto was considered top tier quality of not just Shonen Jump, but of the entire manga medium. And when you look at it objectively, you really can't say that about it anymore. What I most enjoyed about the series was the individual character arcs. My personal favorite outside of the main three was Neji's story of fighting against his fate, how he's been treated as a slave his whole life with no expectation of being anything more than that. Which, by the way, had a really crappy resolution that I'll get into later. God damn it, Kishimoto. Now, before anyone asks, did the ending of Naruto make you hate all of anime? No, it didn't make me hate anime. It made me retroactively hate the series, or at least part two. Yeah, I can still look back at part one as a very good story. But part two, on the other hand, well, this is where the series starts to go downhill. But it was a gradual sense of decay. There are three eras of Naruto. The first is part one, which is the original anime. The second is part two, which is referred to as Shippidon in the anime. And the third is... Ugh, Boruto, but we don't talk about that. For the record, when it comes to analysis of this series, let me tell you my rule. If it isn't in the manga, I don't care. If Studio Perot wrote it, I especially don't care. They are not to be trusted for reasons I might get into later. So part two begins with Naruto looking over the village. After some humorous reintroductions, where we see that Naruto and Sakura have taken after Jiraiya and Tsunade, which doesn't bode well for Sasuke, considering he's with Orochimaru. Kakashi trains them again, and this panel right here where Naruto and Sakura crumble at the mere mention of Sasuke's name is the highlight of a major problem that inhibits their growth as characters for the remainder of the series. I mean, it's kind of understandable at this point, but as time goes on, it gets more and more annoying. We do get to see some good flashes of how Naruto and Sakura have grown, with Sakura now having freakish superhuman strength. Eventually, they get the bells by threatening to spoil Kakashi by the end of Jiraiya's new book, which is not quite how I would have done it, but I suppose it works. We do get a good introduction to the Akatsuki, having them kidnap Garasaurus is a way to make it personal. 
Kishimoto also does a good job establishing Akatsuki's leader, who is shrouded in shadow. Also, we learn what their goal is, to extract all nine of the tail beasts so that they can conquer the world, Gara being the first. Kishimoto also sets very clear rules here that extracting a tail beast is an intricate process that takes a few days, and the more tails, the longer it will take. This just reminds me of that moment with a certain someone. You all probably know what that moment is, and I'll cover it when we get to it. It's here that we learn there are nine total tail beast creatures, which is a bit of a retcon because there was nothing that indicated in the tuning exams that Gara and Naruto's inner monsters were connected in any way. But one that was done so the story could be tied together a bit more. But it does manage to convince you that Gara's being killed off here, which of course he wouldn't actually do, but more on that later. As for other side things, Team Guy's fight with Kasami... happens. Well, actually, it's more or less Guy versus Kasami. Neji, Rock Lee, and Ten Ten don't do much. The highlight of the arc is definitely Sakura and Shio versus Hisori, who serves his role nicely as a starter villain. The emotional highlight is when Chio gives her life to bring Gara back to life in a nice moment. A little curious highlight is Kakashi is shown with his Sharingan on when Chio is bringing Gara back to life. But as far as I can tell, this went nowhere. Nothing in this arc was particularly bad, and characters are still progressing nicely. On a side note, I'm reminded just how much better Neji was than Hinata at, well, everything. But anyway, we are one arc into part two, things are solid, and looking up. And then we get introduced to two new characters who I'm going to be honest are two of the most worthless characters Kishimoto has ever introduced. Sai and Yamato, who are standing in for the replaced Sasuke and Kakashi who is in the hospital, as a way of getting the day XX Machina out of the way. We get more introductions of the now teenage Konoha Chunin, and then we get introduced to Sai in the first of his many penis jokes. Ugh. So, the newly formed Team Kakashi introduce themselves, and Naruto mentions that Sasuke is way cooler than Sai. Oh goody, Naruto. I guess you would hype up your boyfriend, huh? Basically, what Sai is meant to be is an insight into the darker secrets of the Hidden Leaf Village, particularly this man named Donzo, who I will cover more extensively when I reach the Kage Summit arc since he's the primary villain there. For now, though, we do get some insight in that he competed for the Hokage position with the third Hokage, which makes you wonder why he didn't try to seize power after the third died, but he probably hadn't been created yet at the time. Kishimoto is well known for making it up as he goes. So they are confronted by Orochimaru and Naruto goes crazy, even going four tails in the process, and we do get some interesting information. The Nine Tails Demon Fox is slowly taking over Naruto. Jiraiya has fought to contain it. I must say it's rather amazing that Naruto is going four tails because of Orochimaru talking about Sasuke. <laughs> Yeah, I really shouldn't make the jokes, but it's just so, so easy. <laughs> Sai goes on his secret mission, even actually abandoning Sakura to die, but Yamato saves her. I guess that's a thing in this series, leaving people to die. Naruto is turned back, and Sai goes with Orochimaru because his mission is to kill Sasuke, but he can't go through with it because of reasons. This does lead to Yamato telling Naruto that he shouldn't rely on the Nine Tails' power, but rather his own, which is kind of broken later on, though this does lead into Naruto's development for the next arc. The only real thing that happens in this whole arc is that Naruto and Sasuke meet for the first time, and it's meant to highlight just how far Sasuke is above Naruto, as highlighted by the fact that he's literally standing right above him. But anyway, Sasuke is no longer the same. He's even more of a jerk. Naruto's team leaves having accomplished absolutely nothing, but they got Sai as a friend, yay? This arc was the first major misstep. It does further some more development to the Ninetales, and it does contain a crucial name drop of Madara Uchiha, and it's kind of weird considering what we know about him later on that Sasuke doesn't know who he is. But the thing is, he couldn't have Sasuke return to the village just yet, so the only thing he could do was just show that Sasuke is still above them. But overall, Sai is just a worthless character who never should have been created. So following that, we get some minor attempts to flesh Sai out where he tries to get to know everyone, including a scene where he tells Sakura she's ugly, and then he decides to tell Ino the opposite of what he feels, he calls her beautiful, even though what he actually meant was that she was ugly. Yeah, and this is why they ended up married in the end? Ugh. So whatever the case, the next arc begins with Hidden and Kakuzu as the villains. In this arc, Naruto noticeably takes a backseat, Oh, he's still present, but this arc is primarily Shikamaru's story. 
Hidden and Kakusu attack the Hidden Leaf Village, and in the struggle, Asuma is killed. This was quite the surprise when I first saw it. I understand why it was done, though. This is supposed to be a story about growing up, and what better way for Shikamaru than to have him lose his teacher and mentor? Oh, and Ino and Choji too, but <laughs> more on that in a minute. But it does give a sense of a coming of age, and sometimes growing up sucks. Naruto's story is that he is training to do another Rasengan so he can take back Sasuke. Oh god, this is where Naruto's Sasuke obsession starts to get really annoying. I'm going to save my thoughts on it when I get to the Kage Summon arc, which assured I will not hold back. So, whatever the case, Shikamaru, Ino, and Choji decide to go and get revenge for Asuma, with Kakashi tagging along. So he helps these kids get revenge for Asuma, but wouldn't help Sasuke get revenge on Hitachi? A bit hypocritical, but I suppose I can at least excuse this since Asuma is a comrade from Kakashi's class. What really stands out to me is that it's all about Shikamaru's growth as a character. Ino and Choji are just kind of along for the ride. I mean, I understand Kishimoto wanted to give Shikamaru his time in the spotlight, but it does seem that Ino and Choji had to suffer because of it. But, on the other hand, Shikamaru's story in this arc is genuinely good stuff. It was a good coming-of-age story. Team 7 arrives for reinforcements, and by that, I mean Naruto. Sakura and Sai don't do anything. This may have been because apparently this arc was supposed to last longer, but Kishimoto's editor told him to wrap this up much quicker, and you can kind of tell too because the conclusion is a bit rushed. I do enjoy Kakashi mentioning that the next generation always surpasses the last, but did Kishimoto honor that theme in the end? Well, that's a tricky question. But unfortunately, after that, we get the first major beginning of the downfall of Naruto, the hunt for Itachi arc, or as is otherwise known as the Year of Sasuke. This is the part in the story where Sasuke basically takes over as main character, and oh boy, this is not going to be fun. So to start off, we see Sasuke is trying not to kill people who he has no beef with. After all, we can't have Sasuke become irredeemably bad, can we? Then Sasuke proceeds to do the beginning of kill off all the villains who are more interesting than he is. Orochimaru has been a good villain. He's affected the plot, he's been a major threat, I can't wait to see the ultimate confrontation with him, and Sasuke just killed him while he was sick. That sure was anticlimactic. So Sasuke then recruits three new characters to his team so he can hunt Itachi, and supposedly, from what I can recall, Kishimo didn't even want to introduce these characters, and you can kind of tell because they are completely boring. Sui Getsu who is literally introduced naked because... why not? Jugo, who is basically an even lamer version of Brawly from Dragon Ball, and Karin, who seems to be the generic tough girl until... Okay, she has a split personality disorder. It's the only possible explanation. Or Sasuke has some magic power that lets girls become irrationally stupid when around him. Meanwhile, Naruto's team teams up with Team 8 and this goes absolutely nowhere. The game Ninja Storm 2 even excludes this whole sequence because it's so pointless. There's some minor setup with Kabuto who it honestly seems like Kishimoto forgot about for a long while. Yeah, there did seem to be a thing by having Naruto's team team up with one of the other teams of Konoha. Rescue Gara was with Team Guy, the last arc was with Team 10, and now this arc with Team 8, and unfortunately Kishimoto squandered any kind of opportunity to flesh out all of these characters. So we get another Sasuke fight scene because Daidara is pissed that somebody else killed Orochimaru instead of him. It's just an excuse to have another Sasuke fight scene. I like Daidara, he has a good personality and he was pretty popular in the popularity polls. I hope he's around for a while. Though he committed suicide by blowing himself up, never mind, well at least Sasuke is dead. Never mind, he's alive! And how is he alive? I mean, he was pretty exhausted and low on chakra, but he somehow managed to summon Manda. A heavy chakra consumption puts him under a genjutsu, also a heavy chakra consumption, and used Manda as a shield. You know, what Sasuke has done here is completely and utterly ridiculous, even by this series' standards. No wonder people call this the Great Snake Escape. It's the first major ass pulled by the Sharingan, and unfortunately it will not be the last. Meanwhile, in the midst of this Uchiha family drama, we finally get official confirmation that the fourth Hokage was Naruto's father, and we learn his mother's name, Kashina. What follows is actually really tense fighting as we get a lot of insight into Jiraiya's backstory as he goes to search for the leader of the Akatsuki. We see that his pupils have turned evil, kind of like Obi-Wan and Darth Vader basically. His prized pupil from the Third War is now the leader of Akatsuki, Pain. Pain with an A, not an E. There is no E in his name, people. Sorry. 
you really get the sense that Jiraiya is as powerful as he's built out to be, and pain comes across as dangerous, and then Jiraiya dies. It's a very sad chapter as Jiraiya believes that his entire life has been a failure. He failed to save Orochimaru, he failed to win Tsunade, he failed to save his teacher and pupil. His pupils turned evil. But there was one bright spot. Naruto. Jiraiya realizes that his role in the story was not to fix everything. No, that's Naruto's job. Jiraiya's death is spectacular, and it's one of my favorite moments in the series. Now, did Naruto succeed where Jiraiya failed? Well, that's a little touchy, but I'm not going to get into it now. But this was genuinely good stuff. Jiraiya's final moments were perfect. Had part two had more moments like this, it would probably be better remembered. Of course, this is where we find out that Naruto is the child of prophecy, something I felt was wholly unneeded, and it definitely undid the whole Naruto was the underdog appeal. Though I suppose being the son of the fourth Fokage kind of already did that. Here's why I think it was done. Throughout this story, to this point, Sasuke was the one driving the plot. Sasuke acts, Naruto reacts, that's how it was going. The Child of Prophecy hook was done so Kishimoto could make Naruto the star again. Meanwhile, Sasuke is facing off of Itachi. Okay, I thought there's been so much build up to this that there is no way that this fight could be bad. And then Itachi pulls out the Susanoo, making yet another ass pull power up for the Sharingan. I and mean, how does a power from the eye summon a magic armor that basically makes you immortal? Oh, and Orochimaru comes out and gets resealed immediately. So yeah, that's anticlimactic death number two. Still would have been preferable to him getting away with everything, but that's another story. Anyway, Itachi dies. Rather suddenly, too, and just kinda... Eh, forget it. Sasuke wakes up, and it turns out that Tobi is really Uchiha Madara. Yeah, this twist. There was always something odd about Tobi, but I do feel this was dumb because Pain was about to be killed off, so Kishimoto needed a new villain to keep the series going. Now, I know who he really is, and I'm going to pretty much give it away later on when I cover my analysis of what could have been different, but I'll get into that later. Madara tells Sasuke that Itachi was really loyal to Konoha all along, and he wanted Sasuke to kill him and return home a hero. The Konoha elders were the ones responsible for the Uchiha massacre, so Itachi killed his own clan to prevent a war. This was controversial. I didn't mind it so much. It was definitely planned from when Sasuke was having his flashback at the end of part one, but unfortunately, and Kishimoto admitted this, he didn't get the idea to make Itachi a good guy until later on, which caused clashes from how he was originally portrayed. When Itachi first appears, he's basically just a true bad guy with no redeeming qualities whatsoever. But now we're supposed to buy that he's always been secretly a good guy, despite putting his brother through a cruel genjutsu and driving him away from home to seek power from Orochimaru? Oi, yeah, Itachi kind of sucks as a good guy, doesn't he? The problem is, genocide is never okay, and Kishimoto doesn't give a reason for why this situation couldn't have been resolved peacefully. So we're supposed to see Itachi as this good guy who really loved his brother all along, despite the fact that he put him in a cruel genjutsu twice! That just doesn't add up at all. But anyway, Sasuke then becomes completely unlikable because he decides to just kill all of Konoha. It doesn't really make any sense, but okay. Here's the problem. Itachi was basically set up to be Sasuke's ultimate obstacle. Defeating him was Sasuke's ultimate tetch, which he didn't even technically do. Itachi let him win, but I digress. Once Sasuke does that, his story is over. So thus, Kishimoto had to do something with Sasuke because his story had basically been concluded. But by doing this, Sasuke has become completely and utterly unlikable. No, I didn't used to mind him too much, but after this, oh, you better believe I hated him. Like all the conclusions you can come to, and this is your reaction? Ugh. One of many, many stupid decisions by Sasuke. So then Sasuke is sent after the Eight Tails host because that's the next tail beast to be captured. Yeah, Kishimoto really glossed over that, didn't he? Any other writer would have done something with all the other tail beast hosts, but not Kishimoto! Oh no. All that time we spent on Sasuke and Itachi could have been better used to develop other characters outside of the main cast and expanded on the world of Naruto. The world feels so big and expansive, yet so small and narrow at the same time. It is gratifying to watch Killer B kick Sasuke's ass, but then Sasuke pulls another move out of his ass and seemingly captures Killer B. But it turns out Killer B let him win so that he could get away for a while. Uh-huh. Meanwhile, back in the village, Naruto learns of Jiraiya's death, and it's well-paced, well done, and I like that it was Aruka who comforted him, and it gives Naruto the motivation he needs to avenge him. 
So what happens next is we get Naruto away on training while the Leaf Village is attacked by pain. This was actually really well done, as I genuinely believed that characters were dying for good. I even actually got scared that he was really going to kill Kakashi, who would have died for Choji of all characters. I mean, that should have been a sign that it wasn't going to stick. If Kakashi was to die, he should have died for Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura. Basically, this is classic shonen storytelling. The main hub area is under attack, the good guys are fighting insurmountable odds against the main villain, all while the main hero is incapacitated or training. This is done to keep your main hero out of the picture so he doesn't resolve everything right away. I must admit, I loved Naruto's return. It was incredibly hype-inducing, and the action is top-notch. You even get the sense that Naruto would have won, but Pain was able to distract him and pin him down. Pain brings up that the smaller villages are oppressed and how he wants to bring peace to them specifically. This is actually really interesting world building. I was really curious to see what Kishima would do with this, as it would add a sense of moral ambiguity to Naruto's struggle. And of course, he did nothing with it! All of this world building was for absolutely nothing! Fantastic Kishimoto, just fantastic. Hinata decides to prove that the power of love means absolutely nothing when up against the power to repel gravity! Ouch. So Naruto goes six tails, which is a little disappointing. I was hoping Kishimoto wouldn't bring it back for this fight. So now Naruto is at his lowest point. But then Naruto meets his dad. Yeah, I remember this had a fair deal of hype. I think it's a little bit of a Day Six Machina, unfortunately, but... One that kind of makes sense, it does make sense that Minato would have some kind of safeguard. It is kind of amusing to see Naruto give his dad a punch to the stomach because he sealed the QB inside him. So we get some touching words that I like as father and son. So anyway, Naruto goes back, beats Pain, and tracks the real Pain to his location whose name is Nagato, which I haven't mentioned yet. We see that Nagato is a decrepit old man. I actually didn't mind this because I kind of like the contrast that created. It's just like how Darth Vader was this big, imposing bad guy, and then at the end of Return of the Jedi, you see that he's really a weak old man. But we get a very long and uninteresting backstory, unfortunately, and I must admit I checked out why I was reading this. Throughout the whole fight, Nagato has been challenging Naruto's views. How will he bring peace to a world that is torn apart by war? And Naruto didn't really have an answer. It basically just goes like this. How will you bring peace? I don't know. Alright, I'll just destroy everything. How will you bring peace? I'll do something. That's a much better answer. I instantly regret everything. Then Nagato brings everyone back to life, killing himself in the process, basically going all Shenron on us. This was controversial back then because unfortunately Kishimo didn't really set up the idea that he could do this. I think he realized he wrote himself into a corner by killing off most of those characters, so he realized, Oh crap, I gotta bring them all back. Still, that being said, I do like the moment where Naruto gets welcomed back as a hero, because it does feel earned. However, this also feels like an ending. Naruto's whole story is about gaining acceptance and becoming loved, and he's pretty much accomplished that. His personal story is complete. I do think that it could have been saved for the ending of the series. But for this particular moment, at this time, it works well enough. But we still have a whole other half to go, as this is chapter 450, and this series is 700 chapters. Oi. This could have been a beautiful ending to the series, and I wish it was, but we still had some loose ends to clean up. For now, though, next time we're going to be getting into the deep territory, as I think the next arc is where everything truly started becoming undone. Next is the Kage Summit arc, and oh boy, this is not going to be fun. I'm going to warn you, starting with the next video, I will be letting loose my PERSONAL FEELINGS towards this series. Yep, we have reached that point. Many have different opinions as to when the downfall of Naruto began. Some say at the beginning of Part 2. Some say the year of Sasuke. Some say the end of the pain vision. Some say it was crap from the very beginning and was never good. Now, I can respect all of those opinions, even if some of them are dead wrong. 
But I don't hate on the series because I want to hate it. I don't hate it because I need something to rant about. This was the first manga I ever read in serial release, and I really wanted it to be good. I had hoped that Naruto would recapture the magic it once had, but unfortunately as time went on, I lost my patience. And for me, the seeds for the end began with this arc, the Kage Summit arc. This is the arc where everything goes wrong. Also, before we begin, I feel a bit of behind the scenes information is necessary. You see, I credit most of Naruto's early success not entirely to Kishimoto, but to his original editor, Sosuke Yahagi, who seems like he was the real creative force behind Naruto, because without him, well, Naruto wouldn't have been what it was. Editors in Shonen Jump are a very tricky thing. They can help you out immensely, or they can interfere in the creation of your story. Like how in the Cell Saga of Dragon Ball, the villains kept changing because Toriyama's editors didn't like the villains he already had, but that's another story. If I would say Toriyama and Kishimoto are similar in any way, is that they both need someone to reel them in for doing something too wacky. Like the Boo Saga in Dragon Ball, which was my least favorite arc of the series, and even that had its good moments. But back on topic... Yahagi left around the time of Sasuke vs. Itachi, and it can be assumed that he and Kishimoto had planned out the Pain Invasion arc in advance. But after this, Kishimoto had a new editor, whose name I can't find, and with a new editor comes a new direction, and if you've been paying attention to the title of these videos, it was not a good direction. From this moment on, we have what my friend and I like to call the Kishi Way. 1G equals 30B plus 2A, U plus R. What do they mean? I'll tell you. G equals good, B equals bad, A equals ass pull, U equals Uchiha, R equals Rinnegan. Basically, what it means is that for every one good chapter, you're going to get 30 bad ones with two ass pulls per Sharingan or Rinnegan user. That's the Kishi way! To start off, Tsunade is in a coma because Kishimoto no doubt needed her out of the way so Donzo could make his move. Yeah, Donzo pretty much takes over as the main antagonist of this arc. So everyone's trying to pick a new Hokage while Tsunade is unconscious. They're going to pick Kakashi, but then Donzo convinces them to make him Okage with just a two-second speech. Uh-huh. So basically what happens here is we get some more comparisons between Naruto and Sasuke. Naruto didn't understand Sasuke before because he didn't experience the loss like Sasuke did, but now with Jiraiya's death, he understands. Unlike Sasuke, Naruto didn't take revenge, even though as I keep stressing, Sasuke didn't actually kill Itachi, Itachi just dropped dead. However, things get complicated since Sasuke attacked Killer B and abducted him. Donzo's first order of business is to kill Sasuke. Of course, Naruto and Sakura don't take the news well that Sasuke's gone rogue, and Sakura proceeds to regress wildly by crying about it. Nice going, Kishimoto. Before we begin, let's look at this color page. Dear Lord, Naruto, what is wrong with your arms? Kishimoto has his strengths as an artist, but perception is not one of them. Meanwhile, Madara tells Sasuke that Donzo is the one who gave the order to kill the Uchiha's, so Sasuke decides to go kill him the Kage meeting where he'll be heavily guarded. Makes total sense. Ugh, Sasuke. Anyway, Madara decides to stop being cautious and mentions his Moon's Eye plan. Oh god, no. Not yet. Soon, though. Very soon. Then we finally get introductions to all of the other Kages, which has been a long time coming. And I do like them, even if the Mizukage is way too obsessed with finding a husband because, ugh, Kishimoto. Naruto lets himself get beat up so that they won't beat up Sasuke. Sai points out that Naruto has no reason to be doing this for Sasuke. And as much as I don't care for Sai, I kind of agree with him here. But I'll get into it at the end of the video. So Naruto mentions that he met the fourth, and Kakashi reveals that he knows he's his son. I do question when exactly Kakashi figured that out, if he always knew and kept quiet about it. But then again, I have a feeling Kishimoto really screwed up here. So whatever the case, on the way to the meeting, Danzo is attacked, and we find out that he has the Sharingan. Oh dear god, no, not again! Anyway, Naruto meets with the Raikage, who is Killer B's older brother named A. Get it? A? B? Oh boy. Not getting into that. But Naruto decides to do the opposite of what he should do, and cries and begs Raikage to not take revenge on Sasuke. When, if anything, if Naruto had just gone sage mode and broken a boulder, the Raikage probably would have listened to him. You're not making a strong showing for yourself, Naruto. Why, Kishimoto, why? 
So the Kages argue about what to do with Akatsuki. The rest of the kids decide that they're going to kill Sasuke so nobody else will want to take revenge. Makes total sense. Besides, I find it all completely laughable that you guys think you can kill Sasuke. He probably would have killed you all in one move. Ino cries for the guy, despite the fact that she doesn't know him. Sakura decides to go talk to Naruto herself, which is the beginning of the end for her, but that's shipping talk. I'm not getting into that right now. Anyways, Zetsu decides to spill out that Sasuke is nearby, and Madara goes to talk with Naruto. Meanwhile, we get to see the samurai, who look really cool, but are utterly wasted. That's another Kishimoto equation. Give interesting world building, and then do absolutely nothing with it! Then, a very confusing panel that implies that something is possessing Sasuke. Like, I still don't get what Kishimoto was going for with this. But then Sasuke starts killing people, so he's pretty much thrown away his whole never hurt innocent. So another step towards becoming evil, if he's not already there. Anyway, Raikage and Sasuke fight, and it's just another excuse for Sasuke to do more bullshit powers with his stupid MacGuffin that Kishimoto just decided on now. The equation is strong, people. Jugo and Sui get to decide to help and do absolutely no good whatsoever. You know, I'll just get my rant about these three characters out of the way. It's so incredibly obvious that Kishimoto wasn't very interested in them. Sui Getsu is the only one who could have a character if only Kishimoto actually bothered. N meanwhile, Madara tells Naruto about the Curse of Hatred, which runs deep within Sasuke and how that is driving him. We get some backstory information on the Sage of Six Paths who had two sons. One was the ancestor of the Senju, and the other the Uchiha. The two brothers came to clash, and it's repeated throughout generations. Naruto and Sasuke are the next two to do this. Okay. Anyway, back to the fight. There's one glorious moment where Raikage slams Sasuke into the ground, and it's just beautiful! <sighs> if only he died there. Anyway, Gar tries to reason with Sasuke, but Sasuke just gives a lame response that my only goal lies in the darkness, like an idiot. Then Sasuke activates his own Susanoo out of nowhere. People like to complain about Rey from the Star Wars sequels getting powers too easily, and I agree it's a problem. But it's also a big reason why I hate Sasuke, because he gets everything handed to him on a silver platter. Sasuke basically decides to leave Jugo and Sui Getsu behind, which is odd. Remember when he fought a Team 7 when he was protecting these guys from Killer B? Although a bit of an art error was made, as it's part 1 Naruto and part 2 Sakura for some reason? But I digress. Sasuke is rescued by Madara, who then reveals what his plan is. Madara teleports Sasuke and Kara into another dimension because the Sharingan can do that now. <sighs> That's it. No more holding back. The Sharingan in part 1 was basically a tool used by ninjas to become more powerful. When they turned it on, that meant they meant business. But in part 2, the Sharingan has basically become do whatever the hell I want power up. Whenever Kichimo needs a new power, rather than inventing a new jutsu, just have the Sharingan do it. The equation, people! Remember the equation! Then Madara reveals that he wants to make the Ten Tails. Now... Kishimoto is absolutely making this up because in the original folk tale of the Nine-Tailed Beast, there was no Ten Tails. Kishimoto probably needed something to unite everybody. Basically, long story short, Madara is going to use the moon as a projector screen to broadcast his PowerPoint of Doom. Why wasn't Pain the final villain? He was perfect! Madara wants them to cooperate, they say no, so Madara decides to declare war. Which is odd, if you had just worked in secret, they would have never found out about it and would have never united to stop you. Why is everybody so stupid? So the Kagris decide to form a ninja alliance. Yeah, this. Let me explain what could have been done better when I get to the end. Anyway, some other stuff happens. Sakura decides to go after Sasuke on her own. Kurobi and Raikage seemingly kill Kusame, which was odd, but then Kishimoto decided, no, just kidding. Sai tells Naruto that Sakura couldn't tell him that they were going to kill Sasuke. Sakura is going to kill him because she loves him. Ugh, her stupid infatuation. Not love, infatuation completely kills any progress her character makes. And Naruto reacts by having a panic attack and fainting. <sighs> Moving on, Madara decides to attack Danzo or by allowing Sasuke to fight him. Then Danzo reveals that his arm is covered in Sharingans, which is the stupidest thing I have ever seen in any manga. And I've seen a lot of stupidity. 
Anyway, Sasuke gets confirmation from Danzo that the Order of the Massacre of the Uchihas was true. Sasuke and Danzo fight, and Sasuke shows that he can summon Hawks. Yeah, when did he learn that? God damn it, Kishimoto. You just keep giving bullshit power-ups to Sasuke. Now, I know Sasuke was shown riding a hawk on the cover of one of the first chapters, but you can't just show that he has that without proper build-up. So Sasuke and Danzo continue fighting, and Sasuke pulls out an even more powerful Susano, and oh my god, why? Oh lord, I haven't even gotten to the war arc. I'm going to go insane when I get there. Anyway, Sasuke and Danzo stab each other, don't die because of bullshit healing powers. I didn't mention before, but it's really dumb that Karin's healing power requires the person in question to bite her arm. Like, what's up with that? Why couldn't it just be normal medical jutsu? Anyway, Donzo takes Karin hostage, and Sasuke... Uh... Yeah, okay, that's it. I'm done. No more excuses, and I must admit I'm not a fan of Karin, but... Sasuke's an irredeemable prick now. I don't want him to be redeemed. I want him to die horribly. Anyway, Madara orders Sasuke to kill Kurin, and she flashes back to when Sasuke saved her, which is why she likes him. I'm struggling to figure out where this takes place exactly, but either way, it's a retcon. Anyway, Sakura shows up, she's planning to kill him, but she acts like she wants to go along with him. Sasuke tells her to kill Karin to prove it, but Sasuke tries to kill Sakura too! Because one event of crossing the moral event horizon wasn't enough, he's gotta do it twice! But Kakashi shows up and stops him. Kakashi does show a bit of good writing here, as he takes responsibility for what's happening. He tries to reason with Sasuke, who... Yeah, he won't stop until they bring back his clan and family. What a bitch. Also, Sasuke really wants to kill Kakashi. Not sure when he ever had that inkling, but okay. I do like Kakashi's way of rationalizing it, that he still cares for Sasuke, in spite of how far he's fallen. Naruto flashes back to how Itachi told him that Sasuke is a blank canvas that can be filled with any color, which roughly translates to, he'll fill whatever role the offer will need him to do. Sakura tries to kill Sasuke again, but fails him because, oh, oh my god, I swear every panel this arc just gets worse and worse. What is it about Sasuke that causes Sakura to lose all ability to think like a rational human being? What does she see in this asshole? Sasuke tries to kill Sakura again because, yeah, hooray for cruelty! But Naruto arrives and saves the day, so now Naruto and Sasuke finally confront each other. Naruto tries to tell Sasuke he understands, only for Sasuke to continue acting like a little bitch. Sakura actually defends Naruto, which is like, finally, it doesn't make up for how stupid she is around Sasuke, but it's a start. Sasuke claims it feels good to be a murdering psychopath. Yeah, um, evil. He's evil now! Naruto and Sasuke charge. Naruto reflects that their roles could have been reversed, which is a common theme throughout many stories, but as we later find out, their roles were never meant to be reversed at all. Nice job being consistent on that, Kishimoto. That should be another equation. I'll think about it. Anyway, Madara and Zetsu stop the fight because Sasuke is about to go blind. Naruto says he still sees Sasuke as a friend in spite of everything he's done, and that they'll both die when they fight, which doesn't go anywhere. And Sasuke responds by telling Madara that he's going to kill Naruto first, and Madara is probably smiling under his mask. And this arc ends with no chance whatsoever to be satisfying. Oh, and Kabuto's back. More on him next time. So, yeah. I pretty much spent the majority of this video bitching endlessly about how much I hate this arc, so... I guess you don't need me to sum it up. But this arc just fails to deliver on every count. Don't get me wrong, this arc didn't finish Naruto. The war arc finished Naruto for reasons I will get into later. But the Kage Summit arc zoomed the body, dug the grave, and made all the funeral arrangements. To analyze why it's so heartbreakingly bad, I'll cover the four major characters in this arc. First, let's start with Donzo. Donzo ends up feeling wasted, and so he's disappointing. I get the idea was that he was supposed to be like Magneto. He had good intentions, but went about it the wrong way. Unfortunately, instead of using Donzo as a way to have a civil war occur within the Leaf and test the loyalties among the characters, he's instead just used as another character to hype up Sasuke. He added some moral ambiguity, but Kishimoto just did not know how to handle that. 
Worse than that, though, is how the three main characters, Naruto, Sasuke, and Sakura, are handled. Let's start with Sakura. Poor Sakura. She was on her way to becoming a good character, and then this arc happened. She took five steps backwards. She completely fails at everything she sets out to do, loses the nerve to kill Sasuke, her Sasuke obsession is back in full force, and at the end she decides, I'll just be useless. So any kind of progression she had is gone. Nice going, Kishimoto. Nice going. Naruto spends most of the arc crying about how everyone is going to kill Sasuke. Yeah, Sakura's obsession with Sasuke is bad, but I'm not cutting Naruto any slack for his. This arc feels like a wasted opportunity with Naruto. This series is supposed to be about Naruto's progression to becoming Hokage. What he was lacking was leadership. This should have been the arc where he learned how to be a leader. He should have been the one to rally the nations against Madara. He should have been the one taking charge of the Sasuke situation instead of having everyone else do it. So many missed opportunities. Just... Ugh. Instead of crying, he should have been trying to take charge. Ugh. Worse than all this is Sasuke. Oh god, Sasuke. Sasuke in this arc suddenly turns from anti-hero to out-and-out -out villain. Kishimoto took Sasuke way too far. His sudden change in attitude is not believable in the slightest. He throws away his comrades, tries to kill Kara and Sakura without remorse, and just comes off as a complete psychopath. Now some people say, oh, he wasn't in the right state of mind. Well, by your logic, Joker shouldn't be held responsible for all the terrible things that he does, and that's truly disturbing. Now, if Sasuke was a good kid who was tragically tempted by revenge and hatred, it'd be one thing. But instead, like Anakin from the Star Wars prequels, Sasuke is written as a bad apple from the start. He's closed off, he's cold and distant, and is just overall a completely unlikable character. Now, people argue, is it more important that your characters be admirable or complex? I think it depends on the series, but in the Shonen series, it's definitely more important that your characters be likable. And Sasuke is not likable in the least. Let me compare Sasuke to Shadow from Sonic Adventure 2. Shadow starts off as someone who wants to kill everyone because he thinks that's what his friend Maria wanted. But when he realized that wasn't what she wanted, he repented and helped save the world at the cost of his own life. Until he came back in the next game because he was so popular, but that's another story. Sasuke, on the other hand, knows that this isn't what Itachi wanted and is doing it anyway! This stems from the problem. We were never shown Team 7 going on missions in Part 1 outside of the Land of Waves. Therefore, we have no reason to understand why they want to get Sasuke back so badly. Sasuke, as we have seen, is not someone who Naruto or Sakura should be looking back on with any kind of fondness. Hell, if I were Naruto, I would not look back on Sasuke with any kind of longing for the old days. If anything, I'd be uncomfortable talking about him, and my only regret would be that I didn't kill the bastard when I had the chance. But, we're not done yet. I have one last bit of this series to praise, and I'm going to do it real quick before we get to the war arc, which, as I've already pointed out, was where Naruto became irredeemably bad. I have a little bit over 200 chapters left to cover, and I need to be prepared, so I'm going to buy the biggest bottle of alcohol I can get. This is not going to be fun. <laughs> Well, we're near the end, and quite frankly, I can't wait to finally put this series behind me so I can move on with my life. But as you can tell by the title, this is the last bit of the series that actually feels like it's a worthy addition to the series. It's the arc where we finally get answers to what happened on that fateful night the fourth Okage sealed the Nine Tails inside of Naruto. It's an arc that was a long time coming, and for what it's worth, I feel Kishimoto genuinely delivered. But before we analyze why it was so good, it's time for some backstory. During the time of the series, Kishimoto was a very busy man. In the time of Naruto's publication, he got married and had two kids. It was around this time that Kishimoto's wife actually came up to him and basically said something along the lines of, Now that you have kids, don't you want to show Naruto's family? And that she wanted Naruto's mother to get involved in the story. Kishimoto said something along the lines of, 
It was originally going to be one to two chapters, but at her insistence, it became a full volume. Wow, uh, do you not care about your main character's history? I guess because it's not Uchiha related, why would you? So, whatever the case, Naruto tells the rest of the Konai kids to leave Sasuke to him. Tsunade wakes up, so we are spared Kakashi becoming Hokage. Oh boy, that reminds me of the ending. I'd be getting ahead of myself though, so we're not going into it yet. Remember Kakashi's line of being unworthy for the position. I will. Anyway, Naruto gets summoned by the great Toad Sage, who tells Naruto his future that he will meet an octopus and fight a young man with powerful eyes, but Naruto cuts him off saying that he already knows all that, and yeah. I mean, you could have at the very least let him finish Naruto. It might have been useful info. But it's important because they give him the key to undo the four seal. It's finally time for Naruto to confront the Ninetales. Meanwhile, Kabuto decides to form an alliance with Madara while showing a secret coffin that gets him a little nervous. The whole purpose of this scene is so Kishimoto could provide an army for Madara to fight with, which makes me wonder, just what exactly was his plan? Kabuto came to him, not the other way around. Really, this was done because Kishimoto realized that he wrote himself into a corner by killing off most of his villains before the war arc, so he had to bring them all back to life so the army would have something to fight. For what it's worth, I did agree with Naruto's reasoning here that he needs to stop running from the Ninetales power and he needs to embrace it if he wants to have a chance at beating Sasuke. Meanwhile, the Kagegis decide that the best thing to do is to hide Naruto and Killer Beast so that Madara can't track them, which is stupid. Why would you not want to have your most powerful ninja on the battlefield? Let's bear in mind, Madara does have seven of the Ninetales beasts already. But whatever the case, Naruto and Killer Beast finally meet and let's just say I love this. Kishimoto finally gave me what I wanted. Two idiots interacting with each other, and it's hilarious. Anyway, Killer B agrees to help Naruto master his tail of beast, and takes him to the waterfall when Naruto encounters another Naruto. It's kind of like when Luke entered the cave in the Empire Strikes Back and found himself in Darth Vader, a twisted mirror version of himself. There's a lot of potential here. Also, Dark Naruto's design isn't very original. Maybe it could have been like Dark Link, where he's basically just Link colored black with red eyes. That would have gotten the point across better. Anyway, Dark Naruto basically lectures Naruto about how he's so easily slayed by helping the villagers, despite them treating him like crap for years. That's part of it. But I was hoping we'd get more insight into Naruto's shortcomings, like what's going on with Sasuke. Is he even worth saving? What's going on with Sakura? Kakashi? His feelings on Jiraiya being dead? Did he fail him? There was so much potential for some good character digging here, and it feels like Kishimoto wasted it. Anyway, we get a brief flashback as to how Kurobi gained control of the Eight Tails, which just serves as another Naruto-Sasuke parallel, because 60% of Naruto's lore are Naruto-Sasuke parallels. Anyway, random squid attack, which is meant to show that Killer B is compassionate and that Naruto should be too. So Naruto goes back and pretty much talks his dark side down. Yeah, talk no jutsu, but in this case I don't mind it because I understand what Kishimoto was going for. Everyone has a light and dark half, it's the side we act on that determines who we truly are, and Naruto was accepting that his dark half was a part of him. So now Naruto finally confronts the Ninetales. It's actually really well done, as Naruto must confront the evil of the Ninetales Demon Fox, which has been said to be pure evil force. Just when it looks like Naruto will lose, but then the light comes in and it's Kashina, Naruto's mother. Kishimoto did a good job with her introduction. It's a good shift from comedy to heartwarming. Kashina helps Naruto take down the Ninetales and mother and son talk and it's very nice. They're very similar in personality. Then Naruto asks Kashina how she and Minato fell in love. Yeah, I'm getting a bit off tangent, but fuck you, the last, for saying that Naruto doesn't know the difference between loving a person and loving food, despite clear evidence to the contrary in the manga. Despite being billed as canon, you will never be canon to the manga as far as I'm concerned, and you're just a terrible movie in general. I probably will have to address that movie when I get to the ending. I'd love to make a critique tearing that movie apart, but there's no way I could do it without getting flagged for copyright, and the Naruhina shippers would probably want my head on a platter. They're rather tenacious. <clears throat> anyway, Kashina tells Naruto the story of how she and Minato fell in love, and it's so good and engrossing for the first time in a while, I was legitimately enjoying Naruto again. Helps that that loathsome cunt Sasuke isn't involved. There's a certain quality that comes out whenever Sasuke isn't in the picture. Naruto is both of his mother's and father's wills together, 
But now it's time for Mother and Son to get to work, and it's outright badass the way they subdue the Ninetales. And Naruto gets the results of it with a, what is basically a Super Saiyan ripoff. I mean, no, really, that's basically what it is. It was still kind of disappointing. We barely got to see him use Sage Mode, and Kishimo is already giving him a new form. But before Kishina can move on, she's going to tell Naruto the truth of what happened that night 16 years ago. Kishina was the original Jinjuruki of the Ninetales, and that the Yuzumaki clan were an offshoot of the Senju clan, which is another example of Kishimoto barely going into the Yuzumaki clan. But anyway, Kishina tells Naruto that there's one moment where the seal is weakest, and it's during childbirth. Which means a male host will never have that problem, but I digress. Of course, Kishimoto put in a scene with baby Sasuke with their moms hoping that they'll be friends, because of course he did! Anyway, the birth goes without a hitch, but then the masked man appears. Man, that is such an evil man. Such a great way of conditioning us to hate him. Really hope Kishimoto doesn't try to make him sympathetic. The masked man extracts the nine tails from Kishina, and he sticks it on Konoha with only the fourth Hokage standing in his way. The action is so good, and we get to see why the fourth Hokage is so well known, because he's so fast. It's just awesome to look at. They're able to get the nine tails sealed down, and Kashina, with her dying breath, says that she will take the Ninetales into her and die with it. But Minato can't bear the thought of Kashina never meeting her son, so he does something rather hasty and ensures that Naruto will grow up without either of his parents, but then I suppose he's highly emotional at this point, so he's probably not thinking straight. Kashina's dying moments are to fill her son with as much love as she can, and it's really heartbreaking, and Minato just agrees with her. Then, one final heartbreaking scene as Naruto says goodbye to his mother. Considering the foreknowledge of what ultimately ended up happening, it's all the more sadder. But, not yet. Not yet. Anyway, that's not quite the end of the arc. Kisame attacks, and Guy steps up to stop him because it's kind of fitting. The fight between Guy and Kisame is... adequate. It's not my favorite, but it does its job well enough, and Studio Pro did an absolutely crap tack or job in animating it, but that's one of their many failures. Kasame has a flashback, which, unless you're Naruto or Sasuke, is typically a sign of death on coming in this series. Kasame dies, and it's about damn time! But before we wrap up, Madara has decided to go visit Conan. He needs something of Nagato's. Conan absolutely owns Madara. He really can't fight. Madara only wins through another Sharingan Aspel, the Isignage, which basically allows people to bend reality to their will or something. Yeah, I guess eyes can do that. Conan dies, which is a bit of a shame as I feel Kishimoto wasted her potential. Imagine if she came to help Naruto during the war. It would have been epic and would have made her character much more memorable. How come Conan never fought Sakura? The setup was perfect, yet Kishimoto did nothing with it. Anyway, some other setup stuff happens. Yamato gets captured and is probably forgotten about till the end of the series, which is odd. But the stage is set for the war to begin, and that is where we will leave off for now. Let me tell you something. I just finished chapter 514, and this series is 700 chapters, which means the remaining 185 chapters covered this war. And, oh boy, it had some good build-up, and people were hyped when it began. But unfortunately, it didn't live up to expectations. However, I call this video one last bit of quality because... It is. The story of Naruto's parents is well done, it's heartbreaking, beautiful, and there is a passion and a soul put into it. A story without a soul isn't a story at all. I maintained hopes because of this that the ending of the war would be memorable, and unfortunately that was not the case. But it's time to dig deep into this. The next arc is the longest arc of Naruto. I know people break this into three arcs, but for me, it's one big arc. And I'm prepared to go fully deep into it on why the war arc sucked. That's going to be quite the journey. Anyway, if you've been enjoying these videos, please hit that like, bell, and subscribe button. It really helps me out. Thanks.
Before we begin, I'm going to make a little disclaimer. I'd like to apologize if there are any audio issues, but I was yelling so loud that I broke into the mic! I'm sure you'll take that as a good sign. Oh boy, we're here. This is the big finale of Naruto. After the last arc delivered an emotional, heart-wrenching story of two parents who couldn't raise their child, there were hopes that Naruto could be saved. And as you can tell by the title, I don't think it delivered. But why didn't it deliver? This arc is very long, lasting from chapter 515 to 700, which is the epilogue. So the answer to that, well, we're gonna be here for a while, so let's get the introduction out of the way. This can't be that bad, can it? Now, here's what Kishimoto should have done before starting the war arc. Take a month off. Focus on planning out the arc to make sure it was really good and memorable, and unfortunately, he did not do that. Kishimoto rarely, if ever, pauses for research. The only time I could remember him doing so is when he was revealing the truth about Itachi. It tends to show as Kishimoto makes things up as he goes. Now, I can't necessarily bash Kishimoto for that. Name a series, and I guarantee you something was improvised. In Breaking Bad, at the beginning of Season 5, the writers had no idea what Walt was going to use the gun for. Dragon Ball was pretty much written as it went. The thing is, some writers can do this well that it works seamlessly. Kishimoto is not one of those writers. So to start off, we get an establishment of the two armies. One is of the five major villages, and one is composed of white Zetsu and zombies of characters who are dead. Yeah. But the opening pages and Garo's speech do a good job of setting up hype for the battles to come. And then... Some unimportant characters fight instead. We get some minor character advancements. Sai gets some closure with his brother, which would have been great if I had actually cared. Here's the big problem. The war arc at this early stage is that the battles were primarily between our heroes and characters who've been brought back to life, and most of them are fighting the heroes against their will... So, thus, there's really no tension to any of these fights. We get some repeats as we have Kakashi fighting Zabuzo and Haku, which I felt was unnecessary. Zabuzo and Haku had perfect endings. Why bring them back at all? Even Zabuzo seems to agree. This was a chance to actually have Sakura participate in fighting them, but Kishimo doesn't take the opportunity to do so. Instead, after Zabuzo and Haku are once again defeated, we get what might have been Kishimoto's biggest cocktease. Throughout the series, Kakashi has been billed as the one who knows a thousand jutsus, but he only ever seems to use, like, three. Here he's finally about to go on a rampage, and we don't get to see it. Wow. Then we get introduced to the twins, Kin and Jin, who apparently were inside the Ninetales and ate its chakra, and oh my god! I forgot about this! Ugh. 
They're basically dealt with incredibly easily, and I just remember thinking, ooh, that was a thing. Then Kichimoto gives Team 10 another shining moment where they get to fight Asuma. Even though he already gave Team 10 a shining moment, this is a reoccurring thing in the war. Kishimoto likes to give Team 10 moments to shine at the expense of the other teams. Team 8 and Team Guy wish they had these moments together. We also have a minor scuffle going on between Hanzo and Mifune, which Kishimoto really wanted to write, but was told to cut it short and get back to the main characters. And I have to agree with his editors on this one. This fight was really boring because I honestly didn't care about the characters too much. It's really hard to get invested in what's going on. Whatever the case, this finally gets Naruto to realize that something's wrong, and he goes to war. That was much quicker than I expected, but I guess Kishimoto was getting bored doing all these random one-off character battles. <laughs> Here's the big problem with the war so far. This war is pretty clear-cut black and white so far. And that can work, but here it just feels so odd because Kishimoto is having Naruto preach about how he wants to stop all the hatred, but it doesn't really work here because they're fighting full-out bad guys. Here's something I would change to fix that. Instead of having the adversaries be zombies and zetsus, how about instead having Madara's army be the smaller villages that Pain mentioned? Suddenly now this war isn't so black and white, but has a shade of grey to it. So now Naruto is caught between wanting to save his friends and wanting to help the little guys. But this kind of moral ambiguity is something Kishimoto wants to avoid whenever possible. Also, apparently despite one day of fighting, both sides lost an absurd amount of casualties. Yeah, all that fodder in just one day of fighting. Oh lord, I remember this war spans about two and a half days in the universe, which means the rest of this series will cover one single day! Anyway, Madara enters the battlefield, and Naruto and Kyorbi are stopped by Tsunade and Rikage. For what it's worth, I did like the flashback where the four Fokage just dodges Rikage's punch, and then Naruto does the same because, you know, parallels. This whole sequence is just to convince Rikage to let Naruto and Kyorbi help, and I do love how the Rikage is just resigned to do it. Although it's actually kind of nice. Until you get to the bar where Madara literally revived the Jinjuruki and has given each of them a Sharingan and a Rinnegan to become the newest pain. Did I just read a fanfic? Anyway, some other stuff happens. The previous Kage come back, such as Gar's father. They are defeated, which I thought was okay. But then Naruto and Kilri come across Itachi and Nagato and they start to fight. Itachi is freed from Kubuto's control by the crow he implanted into Naruto, which was also basically going to brainwash Sasuke into slavery in case he tried to track the village and... Uh, yeah, Itachi, you suck as a good guy. You really do. Now granted, I don't think this is what Kishimoto intended for the crow to do, but decided, eh, this is a good time to use it. So Itachi and Naruto seal away Nagato, who tells Naruto to make up for the failure that he was, and be a conclusion so spectacular that it will make everyone forget what a failure he was. Ha. 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 Anyway, Itachi basically tells Naruto, don't become like Madara, because he's trying to shoulder everything alone. So Itachi leaves Sasuke to him while he goes to stop Kabuto, and then Naruto sends a clone to help fight the previous Kages, and... Oh, goody. The loathsome cunt is back! Now, to be fair, this was inevitable. But you knew once he came back, the hatred of a thousand burning suns would rise up again. But then... Sasuke disappears again! Odd. <laughs> then things get thrown for a loop when the actual Madara appears on the battlefield! Which is odd, because if he's Madara, then who's the guy behind the mask? <sighs> Madara gets a good introduction with how absurdly powerful he is, but you just had to push it too far, didn't you, Kishimoto? Of course, then we get another ass pool that's not related to the Sharingan or Rinnegan. The Kages decide to use the Flying God technique to get to the battlefield, which apparently the 4th taught these guys, which has never been mentioned before. It's another case of how do I get my characters from here to there sort of situation. But the stage is now set for the 5 Kages to fight Madara, and Naruto begins to fight Tobi. So the final battle begins, and no, I don't mean A final battle, I mean THE final battle. 
as in this is the fight that lasts till the end of the series, and this is the end of chapter 563. Oh boy. Okay, well, Naruto and Toby start fighting, and it actually starts off pretty cool with all the Jinjuruki being there. It's a depth of scale that the series hasn't seen. Then we get a cover page of Sasuke joining the battlefield. This was about 14 chapters later. So it took Sasuke that much time to get out of the hideout, huh? Lord, the pacing. Kakashi and Guy arrive, and it's pretty badass, actually. Naruto then gets to talk to the tail beasts, and I like it as it gives them names like Son Goku, which is really, really cool. And the Nine Tails is Kuruma, which is a Yu Yu Hakusho's character's name. Admittingly, the part where Naruto takes on the Force appearance, I thought that was awesome. Then we get the rest of the kids on the way to assist Naruto and how he's changed them, and then we get the return of Sasuke... again. The way this panel was done, so many people thought Sasuke had gained the ability to see beyond the fourth wall. Which was very possible! So, we are back to Sasuke. But what's going on with the Kages versus Madara? I kinda wanna see that. So, whatever the case, Sasuke is going to head over to kill Naruto, but just happens to see Itachi, which causes him to chase after him instead. <sighs> Kichimoto keeps teasing that Naruto and Sasuke are going to fight, and two years have gone by and they still haven't fought. This better be worth the wait, you freaking cock tease. So Sasuke chases down Itachi and wants answers, a bit understandably, but Itachi decides to just ignore him and goes for Kabuto. But Sasuke decides to come in anyway, and the two brothers decide to fight together to defeat Kabuto, which I have to begrudgingly admit is badass. So we now have three fights going on, and I'll cover them one at a time. We'll start with the Uchiha brothers versus Kabuto. This fight is dreadfully boring. Kabuto reveals that he has snake sage mode, which I don't necessarily mind. It does make sense that the snakes and slugs have a place for sage training. Of course, Kishimoto did nothing with the slug location, which is typical of him! Also, Karin is a member of the Uzumaki clan. This means nothing in the grand scheme of things. I still struggle to figure out what the point of this was. Anyway, Kabuto is completely invulnerable. So Kishimoto invents another ass pull for the Sharingan by having Itachi pulled Izame, which oh so conveniently has the ability to counter what Itachi happens to be fighting. Ah, The equation is still strong. Then Kishimo decides to interrupt the fight with a flashback to Kabuto's backstory. But it's far too late for me to care. And you don't do this in the middle of the fight. You do this at the beginning or the end of the fight, not during. He also gives an explanation for how Kabuto got his glasses. Ugh. This is just like how the Disney Star Wars films have made such a big deal out of the dice for the Millennium Falcon. They were just a random, unimportant background prop, and now they're this big, important thing. Ugh. It's also why I dislike Solo. Not everything needs to have an explanation! Anyway, Itachi tells Kabuto that he needs to accept who he truly is, Except for the fact that Kabuto has done very evil things, so therefore I don't buy that he's secretly a good person deep down. You are who you choose to be. Also, Sasuke totally sucked in this fight. Itachi did all the work. This will be a trend with Sasuke. Anyway, Itachi turns off the Edo Tensei, and Sasuke says he will still destroy Konoha because he's a bitch. But Itachi's final words and goodbye to Sasuke are actually well done for what it's worth. Now, before I continue, I'll talk about the Kages versus Madara, and... Madara just beats the piss out of them without breaking a goddamn sweat. No, seriously, every time Kishimoto focuses on this fight, it's nothing but Madara being better, faster, stronger than all of them. At times, it's pretty cool, but mostly it's just sort of boring because he doesn't even look like he's being pressed hard. He completely no-sells every single attack they throw at him. He Edo Tensei's himself of all things after Itachi turns it off and just... Oh god, I could probably make a whole equation for Madara's bullshit. Anyway, Toby decides to just screw it and summon the Ten Tails, which is like, uh, it's too soon for the big finale, I thought. But I had no idea the amount of bullshit Kishimoto had in store for this. 
But Sasuke now wonders, what is a ninja? So in other words, Sasuke's a dumbass. Then Jugo and Sui get to somehow find out where he is, and Sasuke decides to bring back Orochimaru. Oh no, I really hate this. I really wish Kishimoto didn't bring him back. We were done with him! He was done! But no, he got to get away with everything! What the fuck, Kishimoto? So Sasuke decides to go find the ones who know everything. You know, I'm gonna be perfectly blunt here. I thought Sasuke was going to leap out of the pages of the manga and find himself in Kishimoto's office. I wouldn't have put that past him. So, whatever the case, Toby starts to summon the Ten Tails. Kakashi is able to figure out how Toby's eye works, and Naruto is able to smash Toby's mask, and... I'm not gonna lie, I thought that was awesome! Toby's identity has been a cause for debate. I remember one of the craziest fears was that he was Sasuke from the future. But there were so many ideas, there was no way the answer could possibly be satisfying to everyone. And that is why when it was revealed that he was the character who everyone originally suspected him to be. Obito. Now, I actually really enjoy this chapter because it's almost done without dialogue. You don't even need the HE'S OBITO line. Although the art error where the Four Fokage's head monument is up there is... Unfortunate. I think it was fixed in the volume release. Anyway, Madara arrives and the story reaches its final climax. Which is going to be a hundred chapters long. Oh god! The bullshit that's about to come. This led to another flashback, but one that was necessary, as we needed to cover some history, such as how Obito survived having a rock crush him. That is not an explanation. But whatever the case, Obito's motivation for doing everything is because Rin died. Yeah, it's not really a very good motivation. At the same time, I understand what Kishima was going for. Obito is basically Naruto, but evil. I thought that made for a fantastic parallel, and it was really helped to tie the story together. Also, seeing Kakashi kill Rin did legitimately cause a shocked reaction out of me when I first saw it. But I guess unlike Sasuke trying to kill Sakura, the parallel here is that Kakashi was successful! <laughs> Just kidding. So, whatever the case, the stage is set, the Ten Tails is out, and it's time now for the final showdown. Man, the Ten Tails sure is ugly. Now, to be fair, I think that was the intention. But then, the rest of the army arrives, and they all form a united front. Man, that took a while. They didn't get here until, what, about 40 chapters ago after they started heading there? Anyway, more fighting, and... Oh my god, this fight is still going, isn't it? Some other stuff happens, oh, and Neji dies. Yeah, if you think that's a cliff note in my review, it's a cliff note here, too. Why couldn't Neji and Hinata have just blocked that attack together? Would have been much more badass. I'll save my thoughts on why Neji's death was such a bullshit cop-out by Kishimoto, but it's pairing talk, and we are nearly at that moment. So we get some minor character development for the supporting cast and they form a big bird of love and friendship and there are minor moments that are awesome and all that but then we cut back to Sasuke. Yeah, the middle of the climactic showdown and we're cutting back to Sasuke. Sasuke is back in Konoha and of course Kishimo takes the time to parallel Naruto's arrival at the beginning of part 2 but then something very odd happens. They walk into a secret hideout by the Uzumakis that have these incredibly dangerous and powerful masks, and with those masks, they get the four Hokages out of the Death God! Which is another ass pull. I have so many questions. How can they just walk into a place like this? And why is such a place with such powerful and dangerous artifacts not being kept under guard? How come Naruto doesn't know about this place? If they didn't want Naruto to know about his heritage, how come they gave him his mom's name, considering his mom's family name is the one with all the backstory and history? Anyway, Sasuke decides to ask the four Hokage's questions. Well, by that I mean he asks the first three Hokage's questions. He doesn't ask the fourth anything. Poor Minato. He gets the short end of the stick while he's back. Oh, anyway, one thing I want to point out is Kishimoto has been very inconsistent as to which Hokage is the strongest. At first it seemed to be the third, but now it seems to be the first. 
but I'm not going to stress too much about it because it's really not that important. The third Hokage mentions that Itachi could have been Hokage at age seven. Like, are you serious? You know, I've often wished Kishimoto did something about the fan base and Studio Pro's fanatical obsession with Hinata, but perhaps someone should have done the same thing to him when it comes to Itachi. Also, the second Hokage basically reveals that the Uchiha are motivated by love, not hate. They love so much their wounds will not heal. Oh god, this is awkward. It's basically a brain disorder! So, whatever the case, Kishima decides to give us another flashback all while the battle to save the world is going on. In a lot of ways, it's an informative side story that goes into the history of Hashirama and Madara, but dear god, it was a dick move to do this. It took a few months to get back to the conflict at hand. Now, to be fair, it does do a good job of fleshing out the first Okage and Madara's relationship, I suppose. It does humanize them. But I was against showing their fight since I always felt it should have been left to the reader's imagination since there was no way it could possibly live up to expectations. But then we cut back to Sasuke and with all that he's been told, he decides to help protect the Hidden Leaf Village. Wow, so Sasuke's a good guy again. Well, not quite good, but good god, talk about changing a character. Anyway... Before they head out, Karin shows up, and it's Sui Getsu who gets the blood of her rage instead of the guy who actually deserves it. Why is it that girls can't hit Sasuke? Like, why can't Kishimo just have a girl punch him? Ugh. But maybe she'll finally let Sasuke have it for attempting to kill her. I'm never gonna forgive you for what you've done! Sorry. Ugh. You, you, you... You think sorry is going to cut it after everything you've put me through? I, I, I... You good for nothing? I see you're as weak as always when it comes to Sasuke, Karin. Or she can instantly forgive him! Ah, uh, yeah, sorry I pierced you! <laughs> The final battle with the Kages on top of their monuments is kind of badass. But it doesn't make up for how stupid this chapter was. So we finally cut back to the battle. Some things happen, and then the Kages and Sasuke show up, and we get a rather glorious battle of the first telling Madara that he comes later, and Madara's reaction is just hilarious. And Team 7 is reunited, which is kind of awesome, actually. Sasuke claims he's going to become Hokage. Yeah, sure. Sakura claims she needs to access her true power. Kishimoto really could have set this up better. Also, I would have preferred if Sakura had gotten something unique to her, instead of getting what Tsunade already had. But I imagine Kishimoto was lazy. The other kids get to fight some of the Ten Tails minions doing new attacks, though Hinata's is the most boring. Hooray! You did something Neji could do when he was 12! Team 10's attack is cool though, and Sai attempts to prove he's part of Team 7 but gets shot down. Ha! Huh? Then Team 7 summons their animal summons. While Naruto and Sasuke get younger ones, Sakura gets Katsuya. Why can't Sakura get something unique, Kishimoto? Also, how the hell does the fourth have the Nine Tails chakra? I mean, he took it into his body so that it would die with him, and yet it's with his spirit? No, that's not how it's supposed to work. It would have been reincarnated once it died with Minato, so... Yeah, Minato having this power makes no sense. Kishimoto, you... Ugh. Anyway, moving on. Oh, that's right, I forgot Kakashi and Obito are fighting. But then Obito teleports out and ends up becoming the Ten Tails Jinjuruki. So now it's Naruto, Sasuke, and the Kages versus Obito with everyone else taking a backseat yet again. This fight is not very interesting, mostly because nothing happens for a while. Sasuke doesn't do shit. Basically, this fight, attack, doesn't do anything. Sasuke gets mad at how powerful Naruto is. Then when Naruto is down, Sasuke leaps in and says, I'm just getting started. Well, you're one to talk. You didn't do anything. So you are literally just getting started. So Naruto and Sasuke defeat Obito, but of course Naruto decides to talk no jutsu Obito. 
Let me give you my thoughts on Obito. I think he made for a fantastic parallel to Naruto. Basically Naruto, but evil like I said. But unfortunately he became annoying because he kept repeating the same things. And I get that Naruto changes people by talking to them. But it's just kind of annoying because Kishimoto keeps doing it. You can't have all your villains be Vader. Somebody's gotta be Palpatine! Or Frieza! Have somebody be as evil as Frieza! Now, start begging for your life! Not the Hellless. <laughs> so, Beto is defeated and the Tailed Beast are free. Now, do you know what I wish had happened here? Let me show you the opening of Dragon Ball Z Budokai Tenkaichi. The battle is won, but then... Just imagine how awesome it would have been if Sasuke had started attacking Naruto right then and there, and they could have had their big fight with the whole world watching. Man, it would have been so epic. Anyway, Obito decides to revive everybody, but Madara uses it on himself. Yeah, why not? And oh my god, this fight is still going! But wherever the case... Everybody goes to fight Madara, and Madara just beats the piss out of them without breaking a goddamn sweat. Again, it's nothing but Madara being better, faster, stronger than everyone. He beats the first and second Hokages without even trying, he tanks an absurdly powerful blast, does a Susano without his eyes, you need the Shurengan to be able to do the Susano, but no, Madara gets to ignore this rule for some reason. He also is able to extract all the tail beasts and seal them away without even trying. Remember how it took Akatsuki days to seal one? Madara doesn't care! <sighs> anyway, it puts Naruto on Death's door. And then he stabs Sasuke and puts him at Death's door. Which is great! Watching Sasuke die slowly and painfully is almost worth the stupidity. But you know what really should have happened here? Madara charges at the tail beast and then... <laughs> yeah. So Gar takes Naruto to Sakura and Tsunade to save him. Meanwhile, the third Hokage is fighting off this thing with all five elements. <sighs> Remember how it was clearly established that people can only use two elements and in really special cases do three? Well, nice job being consistent on that rule, Kishimoto! Fuck me! This arc sucks! What's the reason for this? Your rules, Kishimoto! Remember your rules! If you don't obey your rules, we have no reason to respect you as an offer! Ah. Anyway, Sakura actually gets a pretty cool moment where she keeps Naruto's heart beating so that he won't die, which is cool. Anyway, Minato and Kakashi are fighting against Black Zetsu with Hobito's body. This is actually a pretty badass panel, I must admit. Minato attempts to give Naruto his QB power, which raises the question as to why he didn't put half into Naruto and half into Kashina, because it would have saved her life. <sighs> but he fails again. Then Kakashi, Minato, and Gara attempt to stop Madara, but fail. Fortunately, Obito snaps out of his trance and steals it back from Madara. Also, one thing I'll get out of the way, but Minato has basically been reduced to a punching bag. I remember my friends and I were debating about this. My friends said, I think the point is, yeah, he was a legend, but he wasn't a god. Well, apparently, from what I've heard, when Kishimoto attended New York Comic Con 2015, a fan asked him this very question, and Kishimoto looked like a deer caught in the headlights and said, he... he seemed weak? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, Guy goes eight gates, and it's actually pretty freaking awesome. I love this chapter. Guy knows he's only stalling for time and that he's going to die, but that's what makes this so awesome. Meanwhile, Naruto wakes up and starts talking to the Sage of Six Pass, whose name I can't pronounce. 
you think we would get a lot of information here, but instead it's mostly wasted by having Naruto asking him to speak normally. Oh, and the sage has a brother now. I'm sorry, but what? I hated this then, I hate it now, and I will always hate that the sage has a brother. It was pointless, and I don't care if it was done to tie in with that stupid movie! That just makes it worse! Also, Naruto and Sasuke are reincarnations of the sage's two sons. So much for destiny doesn't exist. Not to mention, as I pointed out, this means Naruto was wrong. Their roles were never meant to be reversed. Nice job on being consistent yet again, Kishimoto! Anyway, Naruto and Sasuke are saved from death. Kabuto saved Sasuke, which is just... Yeah... Ah, it's not even worth the time. Naruto saves Guy from dying a warrior's death, which kinda pissed me off. I'd say swap Neji's death for Guy dying. It would have made much more thematic sense, and it would have been a good way for him to go. Infinitely better than having to spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. So now, Naruto and Sasuke have their new Sage power-ups. Sasuke gets the Rinnegan, because of course he does. So the final battle is finally set, and then Madara rips out Kakashi's eye and teleports to the Kamu dimension, even though Obito said that it was impossible for him to do that while he was merged with the Ten Tails, but no, Madara gets to break yet another rule! Oh! Also, I don't get mad at Sakura here because, really, I think things would have been fine if Madara hadn't asked his teleportation powers. I was more angry about that. So, whatever the case, Team 7 has assembled again, and Kagashi flashes back to how his kids have grown. Which reminds me, I'm due for a rant about him very soon. So, now Madara emerges, and some other stuff happens, and he casts the infant Tsuchigome, which traps everyone in it except for Team 7, because they're protected by Sasuke's plot armor. I don't know why that shields it, but it just does. <laughs> Anyway, we then get Sasuke acting like an asshole by telling Sakura and Kakashi that they're useless. Now, we are supposed to see Sasuke as an asshole here, and don't get me wrong, he is absolutely an asshole here. But he's not wrong either. Anyway, we get brief flashes of everyone's dreams. Hinata's dream is entirely predictable. Shikamaru's dream is amusing. Oh, let me give a little rant here. Ino was actually doing pretty well for herself. She was performing well and doing her job, and she was kind of coming across as pretty capable. But then Kishimoto squandered all that progress by having her dream be to have Sasuke and Sai fighting over her. Nice going, Kishimoto. On the other end of the spectrum, I do like Gara's dream, because it's nice to see Naruto and Gara hanging out as kids. Anyway, the PowerPoint ends, and I seriously question why Madara didn't attack them and break the shield. I mean, he's done everything else, why couldn't he do that? I think it was a missed opportunity to not have Team 7 get caught. Them having to see their dreams realized and then realizing it wasn't real and each busting out through sheer willpower would have been much better than what happens next. Oh god, what happens next? At Jump Feast of 2013, Kishimoto admitted that he wrote Madara so powerful that he didn't know how he was going to be defeated. He even threw in this panel of Madara coughing up the sage's tools, which you would think would come back to bite him. And the first gave Sasuke a new move, but these end up going nowhere! Instead, this happens. Yeah, so get this. Apparently all that's happened. All the plot lines, all the villains... All of this was specifically done so Black Zetsu could revive Kaguya, who we didn't even know existed until about 20 chapters ago. Yeah, so Kaguya basically takes over Madara's body, and she claims that the Genjutsu will turn everyone into white Zetsus for her army. Not sure how he went from ideal dream world to turning everyone into Zetsus. I thought the Zetsus were made by Madara, but apparently Kaguya created them now, another retcon. So Kaguya decides to start teleporting everyone everywhere. This is the only thing she does aside from shoot bones at people. She supposedly has every single power known to man, but does she use them? Who knew? <laughs> she just throws bone at people. As for her personality, she has none! Kishimoto attempts to flesh her out by having her remember her two sons by looking at Naruto and Sasuke, 
And that raises another point! Would you make up your mind? Are they the sage and his brother? Or the sage's two sons? Would it kill you to be consistent for once, Kishimoto? Ugh. You know, the bitch, I know you're trying to have Kaguya fill this role as she's this ancient evil who's come back from the dead, but you can't just use Kaguya in that role when Madara already filled that role! Black Zetsu basically reveals that he wrote something on a monument for Madara to read. So basically, everything that has gone wrong in the Naruto world amounts to Black Zetsu writing fan fiction. Yeah. So everybody was basically manipulating each other into doing their building. You ever see that scene in Metal Gear Solid 2 towards the end where all the villains reveal that they were manipulating each other for their own ends? It's the same thing here, but even more stupid. You know what? You would think, after nearly 15 years, that things would be better, that things would improve, that everything would be tied together. Instead, Kishimoto just keeps adding more and more shit to his story that did not need to be in the story! <sighs> just get me out of this. I don't care. Get me out of this! This is garbage! GARBAGE! I can tolerate so much, but... Only if I like the characters, if I care about the characters, but I do care. I do not care about anything that is going on. So, make me care. Do something. Make me care about what is happening. Anyway, they go through various dimensions. Well, an acid dimension, for example. Then she gets the idea to separate Naruto and Sasuke, but Sakura and Obito save him. Now, why doesn't she just separate them again, or just dump them in the acid dimension and be done with it? Well, that would make too much sense. Anyway, Obito sacrifices himself to save Naruto and Sasuke, and at long last, Obito is dead! Finally! For what it's worth, I guess it's the best possible ending that Obito could have gotten. And then Naruto calls Obito the coolest guy, or the greatest. God, what a stupid moment. But, whatever, Obito's finally dead, and we can move on, and wait a minute, why the fuck are you standing up? Wait. What? Wonderful little miracle. Team 7 works together and they seal Kaguya away. Not sure why they couldn't have done that to Madara, but whatever. Madara is spat out and the Kages teleport everyone back with the Sage's help. It, It's over. It's over! Oh, don't get me wrong. It was rushed. It was anticlimactic. But I don't care. The fight is finally over. Then we get a chapter of goodbyes. Kakashi and Obito's goodbye is good... ish. Kakashi's Shurengan days are over, which was expected. And I do legitimately like Hashirama and Madara's final words to each other. It's well done, quick, and to the point. And it's the best possible ending Madara could have gotten. Naruto's final goodbye to his dad is also well done. It was nice of Kishimo to give closure to the last bit of quality the series managed to dish out. Too bad he made it meaningless in the end. So all that's left is to dispel the infant Tsukuyomi, even though you would think that that would have been the first priority to free 99% of the world's population. But then Sasuke reveals that he wants to kill the Kages. Now, to be fair, I knew this was coming. You hadn't been paying attention to Sasuke if you didn't think it was going to happen. So finally, at long last, the stage is set for Naruto and Sasuke's final battle. I kept reading the series because I wanted to see this fight, and it's finally time. But before we can get to that, Sakura looks pissed. Oh, is she finally going to yell at Sasuke for being such an ass? Finally, this has been a long time coming, and she starts begging for Sasuke to stop because she loves him.
BULLSHIT! Sakura, the girl who just landed the deciding punch to seal Kagi away is now crying for Sasuke to stop? She has completely regressed backwards in her development and become completely useless? That's... awful. And it just seems so much worse considering I've had to go through so much information in such a short time. She did have development for this arc. Finding out the enemy's plans, promising Naruto that they would bring Sasuke back together, stopping Zetsu Neji, wiping out a thousand Jubi clones, bringing Naruto back from the dead, and sealing Kaguya. All of that Kishimoto has completely undermined in this moment. None of this shit goes anywhere. So way to go, Kishimoto. Fuck throwing through on foreshadowing and garage development. Sakura, just stand there and cry. Cry for your man as feminism marches right the fuck on. <sighs> then Sasuke knocks her out with... What the fuck? I hate this fucking panel. I hate the abuse inherited within it. I hate that Kishimoto drew this. I hate that his assistants weren't horrified and tried to stop him. I hate that his editors approved it. I hate that Studio Pro animated it. I hate that Viz Media translated it. Fuck this fucking panel. Fuck everything it represents. Just God, why is this in here? Why? Then, Kakashi steps up. You think he would finally tell Sasuke for how poorly he treats Sakura. And this leads me into a rant that I have been saving for over four years. Sakura... just wanted to save you. You tried to kill her once. And she still just keeps shedding tears for you. Because loving you is torturing her. <laughs> Who the hell are you? No, really. Who the hell are you? Sasuke is cruel to Sakura once, and your general response is how dare you not return her feelings? What the hell, Kakashi? In terms of being a teacher, you have failed Sasuke. I am not the biggest fan of Sasuke, as you can tell, but when he says, I have never returned her feelings, he has a freaking point! He is not obligated to return Sakura's feelings. And Sasuke's turn to the darkness is partially your fault because of how poorly you have handled things. Oh, and you didn't teach Sakura a damn thing. You taught Naruto and Sasuke unique abilities, but Sakura, you didn't bother. Also, Sakura's feelings for Sasuke have always been detrimental to her growth, as a shinobi and as a person. I'm not saying he should get involved with Sakura's love life, but when it's a problem that has caused Sakura to nearly die, then it's a problem that needs to be fucking dealt with, and you didn't! What the fuck, Kakashi? In this moment, you have completely and utterly failed as a teacher, and you have failed as Team 7 Sensei! Ugh. So, whatever the case, Naruto and Sasuke go to the Valley of the Hen, because why not? Sasuke sounds like a dumbass with the way he wants to do things. I'll be everyone's enemy, so nobody will ever do anything bad ever again. Makes perfect sense. So, now Naruto and Sasuke can finally fight, and... What?! Are you fucking kidding me?! The fight just started and the manga's ending in five weeks?! You wasted all of our time with all that stuff about Obito, Madara, and Kaguya so that the final battle that I was waiting to see has to be rushed to tie in with that STUPID MOVIE! FUCK THAT MOVIE! Ugh. Okay. Okay. Maybe it'll be good. Maybe. Let's get this over with. The fight is... Much better than the Kaguya fight, but that's such a low bar. Most things in life are better than that fight. Eventually, their Megazord stuff wears out, and they have to fight with their fists, and it's actually kind of awesome. There's even a part where Sasuke gets on top of Naruto and begins punching him repeatedly. It's just like when Ocelot did this against Snake in Metal Gear Solid 4. It's literally the same thing. They even do the scream each other's names. <laughs> So Sakura 
Cooper gets a flashback and wakes up, I'm saving my thoughts on this for the next video because this scene is really pointless. Anyway, Naruto and Sasuke do their final charge, and then they wake up, and then they just talk. Yeah, they just talk, and to be honest, I really liked this chapter. I actually almost began to care for Sasuke. This chapter is so good and perfect, I actually felt something for the first time in a while. I, I cared about what was going on! Then you see that their arms are gone. I will point out that they probably should have died from blood loss ball now, but I'll overlook it because I love the rest of this chapter so much. Unfortunately, there were still two chapters to go. So Sakura arrives, she heals them, Sasuke apologizes, and everyone is set free. Spiral Zetsu is killed, somehow. No, seriously, I don't know why this kills him. Why is Team 10 shown at Niji's funeral instead of Team Guy? Oh, and Kakashi is now Kakage. I mean, what the fuck? What the fuck was wrong with Tsunade? There was no reason for her to step down. Why does Kakashi get to be Hokage now? What was the fucking point? Sasuke gives the lamest apology ever told. Sakura says his arm was almost done. He was going to get his arm back too? Man, he sure got off easy, didn't he? <laughs> Sasuke says he will explore the world, which is probably the best thing for him to do. And Sakura... Ugh. What's the word I'm looking for? Dignity. You don't have it! So Sasuke and Naruto part ways, with Naruto giving Sasuke back his headband. And I do like Sasuke's monologue. The line, that's what makes us ninja, would have been a perfect line to close the series out on. But then we get the epilogue. Oh lord, the epilogue. Epilogues where everyone is married and with kids never go well. Just look at Digimon Adventure Zero Two's epilogue and Harry Potter's epilogue. Mostly because, just like them, this epilogue is all about shipping. Now, I could go into a long and detailed explanation as to how shipping works, but I'll just let J. Jonah Jameson explain. Take it away, Jonah! The internet's rife with footage of Spider-Man chasing the black cat across the rooftops. And apparently, there are hordes of young people cheering them on. They're called shippers. No, that has nothing to do with boats. It's short for relationship. As in, they really want Spider-Man and the black cat to be together romantically. Or they really don't. And they have quite intense arguments about it. Flame wars, I believe, is the term. You know, in my day, we didn't have time for flame wars about shipping. You know why? Because we had jobs! So here's J. Jonah Jameson's public service announcement to our youth. You're into shipping? Join the Navy! Thank you, Jonah. <laughs> This entire chapter doesn't give closure to anything. It's just who married who and their kids. So it's finally time to talk about the ships. I'll do them in order, so we'll start with the fact that Naruto and Hinata ended up married, and let me tell you, I felt nothing seeing this panel, and I still feel nothing years later. Naruhina shippers, congratulations, your pairing means absolutely nothing, as evidenced by the fact that Naruto and Hinata are not shown together nor is it even acknowledged. If it wasn't for the two kids having whiskers, you'd have no idea that they ended up together. So my logic is that he's probably still kind of forgetting that she exists. <laughs> Naruto and Hinata had very little development throughout the series. They barely interacted. Naruto ignored Hinata's confession, while Hinata just continued to devolve into someone who would say, naruto -kun! repeatedly. You want me to be blunt with this pairing? I'll tell you, it was forced and unearned. Naruto and Hinata never had a scene where they got to sit down and talk like real people. Let's compare the scene of Luke and Leia from Return of the Jedi. But, Sam, why are you asking me this? I have no memory of my mother. I never knew her. You see that? That's humanity. 
That's something any relationship, platonic or romance, needs to have. Naruto and Hinata don't have it. You want to see a pairing that feels earned? Here, I'll show you. Thank you, Mary Jane Watson. <laughs> oh, but what about the movie? What about it? You're better off without it. Also, Boruto is an unlikable little brat who was going to attack innocent bystanders. You people wonder why I don't want to watch a series starring this kid. Shikumaro and Tamari is, honestly, the only ship I'm okay with because Kishimoto did enough to make it plausible. Except for the fact that Tamari looks freaking old and miserable. What the fuck? Choji and What's-Her-Name had a kid, but those two never even shared a sentence! They're just married. Um, forget it. And Eno and Sai hooked up? I remember my friend burst out laughing into hysterics when he saw this pairing. There was one panel where Sai called her beautiful, but it was implied that he actually thought that she was ugly. And based on Eno's dream, she saw Sasuke and Sai as interchangeable. Pretty shallow, really. Before we get into that pairing... I will mention I did like Rock Lee being Lee with his kid whose mother I'm not sure was revealed. I had to laugh when it was shown that Ten Ten was a loser. <laughs> but anyway, Naruto stops his son from his act of senseless violence. Boruto just wants to spend time with his dad, but Naruto just says, I can't be around, so deal with it. Yeah, that's how you want to end your series, Kishimoto. Anyway, this girl named Serata comes home, and we find out that Sasuke and Sakura are married. And let me tell you, Sasuke Sakura shippers, so and let me tell you, Sasuke Sakura shippers, something. You might want to turn off this video right now because fuck it, no more holding back. I'm going all in. This shit is toxic. It adds nothing to the story. What the fuck? Sasuke is still wandering the earth while Sakura just sits at home as a housewife doing fuck all in the meantime? You can't have Wanderer Sasuke and Family Man Sasuke and Kishimoto should have known better! Sasuke freaking abused Sakura throughout the story! He treats her like shit! He doesn't see her as a person! He sees her as a thing he can use! He tried to kill her multiple times, and I know what you're going to say, oh, but he wasn't in the right state of mind. Oh, bullshit, he knew damn well what he was doing. He advocated dumping her into lava, and don't give me that, oh, but he held her up after she saved him. I'll just spell that with the fact that if it wasn't for her losing her jacket, that he's such a dick that he would have switched places with her and left her trapped. You know he would have. Here, I'm going to play a scene from Mega Man Maverick Hunter X. Just imagine Sakura in X's place and Sasuke in Vile's place. What's the matter, X? Are you gonna show me your true power? Yeah, pretty horrifying. I have no doubt that he would do that to her. She means that little to him. I'd rather watch Elise kissing Sonic back to life. I'd rather watch Raiden and Rosemary's whole thing in Metal Gear Solid 2 than ever watch Sasuke tap Sakura on the forehead! Sasuke cares nothing for her, and yet she's still smitten with him. What's worse is that Kishimoto claims Sakura would be a terrible person to stop loving him Despite the fact that Sasuke didn't love her back. Yet he also claims that Sakura is addicted to Sasuke like a drug. And that he never gave a reason for why she likes Sasuke because it would sound contrived. Does that make sense to anyone? There you go. Sakura has no reason to love Sasuke. It's shallow and contrived. You ever see Hey Arnold? Helga's in love with Arnold but hides it by being a jerk to him. In a flashback, we see Helga's had a lousy childhood, but one person was nice to her. Hi, nice bow. Huh? I like your bow because it's pink like your pants. You see? There's a reason she likes Arnold. A damn good one. Sasuke and Sakura is a love story worse than Twilight. Twice the abuse... None of the love! 
Fuck this pairing. Fuck anyone who had something to do with it happening. Just fuck this absolutely, positively disgusting toxicity. Anyway, Sasuke's final page is confusing because that's his last picture. Naruto is Hokage, which is great, but why didn't you show his Hokage ceremony? Oh, that's right, you did, and you ruined it by having him miss it. What the fuck? So that's it. No summation of everything the characters have been through. No resolution to what Naruto's answer was for peace. No answer to what happened to the tailed beasts. Just here are some kids, so we can have a sequel that will drag this series out for another ten years, and we're done. That was stupid! And really disappointing. Oh, this video has gone on long enough. Let's just wrap this up real quick. There are dozens of things in Naruto that I think could have been done differently. Of course, all of this could have been forgivable, or at the very least, overlookable, if Kishima had delivered a conclusion as grand, epic, and emotionally satisfying as fans had once come to expect. But that's not what happened. The bottom line of the matter is that when it came down to the critical moment, Masashi Kishimoto didn't pull through in the clutch. Now let me be blunt with you guys. I didn't do these videos because I wanted to hate on Naruto. I wanted to like Naruto. And I still kinda do? But in the end, I just couldn't overlook all this bullshit. There was a genuinely good story in there somewhere, but it was buried. Buried under a bunch of shit. I can no longer enjoy the very first manga that I ever read. Before you ask, will I be checking out Kishimoto's new series, Samurai 8? Why should I? Why should I believe Kishimoto is anything more than a one-hit wonder? Why should I believe that he's learned from his mistakes when he has continued to repeat them? Maybe he has and his new series will be really good and memorable. But I don't expect it to be. I'm done. <sighs> not quite. There's one more video I've been meaning to make. I'm not going to say what it is yet, but I'm sure you have a pretty good idea. I just want to get it over with so I can go back to video game stuff. I have some other stuff to talk about such as Neji's death and why it happened the way it did and what it meant in the end. Hey, for all of you who had the patience to sit through this review series, thank you. I hope you were all able to enjoy Naruto at some point, and honestly, if Naruto was ever to get a resurgence like how Dragon Ball's gotten, I'd be in favor of a full reboot. I think the series needs it. But I'm signing off for now. Thanks for watching, and have a good night. Before we begin, I'd like to say, please subscribe to this channel, it'll really help me out. Also, I started a Discord, which you can find the link to in the description below if you want to join. Also, follow me on Twitter. But now, let's begin the show. As I've done this series, I remember there was a very big debate going on throughout the series. Who was Naruto going to marry? Now that the series has ended, the question was answered, but that just turned the debate into, is it what should have happened? Is it what was supposed to be? Well, I wonder, personally. Every time Kishimoto has been asked about who Naruto ended up marrying, he always gives a very different answer as to when he planned it. One interview, he said it was decided from the beginning. Then he said he decided around the time part two started. Then, in an Anime News Network interview, he said it was decided around the middle of the story. Then, in a recent interview, he was back to saying it was decided at the beginning. Is Kishimoto a liar? Well, I'll let you decide. But the answer's yes. So yeah, this was probably the bloodiest shipping war in anime history. 
but is it what was supposed to happen? Well, let's assume it is true that he planned these pairings in one of them. Well, let's just say that's not the same as planning how to get there, and in that regard, Kishimoto was lazy. As I've repeatedly stressed throughout my series of reviews, Kishimoto is not a very good planner. If he was, the war arc wouldn't have been garbage, but I digress. But really, the heart of the matter is this girl, Hinata. In my analysis of the series, I barely mentioned her, and that's because she's barely in it. In a 700 chapter series, Hinata was in less than 100 chapters, that's not even 10% of the series. I think Hinata had a lot of potential as a character, but like most things in Naruto, said potential was squandered. Now all this isn't to say that I necessarily hate Hinata, no, rather, I hate the people who obsess over her. One thing I learned while Naruto was running is that Hinata has a very loud, obnoxious fanbase who seemed to view her as the main character of the series instead of Naruto. Now, why people like Hinata? Well, I can think of a couple reasons, but yeah, that leads me to my next point. The hatred that Sakura got. It seems that liking Hinata means you have to hate Sakura. Now, that's not always true, but unfortunately that's the reality of many people. Many people who like Hinata hate Sakura because Hinata looks like a sweet, innocent little angel while Sakura is that bitch who rejected them. It's a little pathetic. I mean, I took some screencasts of a Hinata fan and a Sakura hater. Just listen to this. You just mad because Hinata's more popular than Sakura? You mean popular. And married the Hokage while having two kids? Sakura never got a wedding, haha, and she only got one kid because Sasuke doesn't want any more kids with that useless bitch. And she looks like a boy who did sex reassignment surgery look like a girl. Uh huh. Listen, if you hate Sakura because Hinata has bigger boobs, you're fucking pathetic and you make me sick to my stomach. This wouldn't be so much of a problem, but this Hinata favoritism extends to the people who worked on the Naruto series officially. Studio Pro, who animated the Naruto anime, have a large portion of their staff who are fanatically obsessed with this girl. Now, can I accuse Studio Pro of changing the pairings to better suit Hinata because they were biased? Was the ending different until Studio Pro stepped in? No, I can't accuse Studio Pro of that without any proof. However, was Hinata their go-to for fan service? abso freaking lutely The last, one of the many reasons I detest that movie is because it's not a story, it's just Studio Pro satisfying their inner Hinata fetishes. They don't see Hinata as a character, they see her as a sex doll for their sexual pleasures, as evidenced by the fact that one of them drew Naruto and Hinata having sex and posted it on Twitter. I'm not going to show you it because, dear god, keep that shit for Rule 34. I think he got in trouble for it, and he should have. Now, does Studio Pro hate Sakura? No, I think they denied that they hated Sakura, but after the release of The Last, that was a reputation that they had to fight. They kind of always had that reputation, but now it was full-blown. Kishimoto, for his part, was rather stunned at the backlash. One thing I remember, as of this writing, I'm not sure if I can find it because a lot of them were deleted, but on Kishimoto's thank you page after the series concluded, let's just say things weren't pretty. Oh my god, what a mess that turned into. But one thing that stuck out to me, I was far from the only person who despised Sasuke and Sakura ending up together. I distinctly remember a father, I believe, writing to him, and he basically told Kishimoto off for having Sasuke and Sakura end together. He said something along the lines of, You gave my daughters a bad message. We are done with you and your work. <sighs> yeah, I can't say he didn't deserve that. Either way, I think that got to him. But what could he do? The plan was already set in stone. They were moving ahead with the next generation, but they had fans bashing them, criticizing them, and what could they do to win them back? I think Kishima looked at the situation and knew that a deed once done could not be undone. But perhaps, it may yet be mitigated, which is where Naruto Gaiden comes in. Now, let me clarify something. While I don't like Sasuke and Sakura ending up together, the real irony of that is that I actually kinda like Serata. No, seriously, I don't mind her. She's okay. She's not great, but she's okay. She's kind of adorable, and I like her way more than Boruto. 
Maybe I'd be more interested in the next generation if she was the main character instead of Borto. I could go into why Naruto Gaiden wasn't very good overall, but that's another video. And I didn't cover it because it's not part of the main manga. Maybe one day I will, but that's not for a while. If I ever figure out how to show anime footage without getting flagged for copyright, I'd love to tear down it the last and cover extensively why that movie isn't very good. Now back on topic. This favoritism of Hinata extends to CyberConnect who made the Ninja Storm video games on which I took footage from. They put Hinata in the opening credits of Ninja Storm 4 despite the fact that she doesn't even get a fight to herself. I prayed through Adventure Mode and it was literally, Hinata is so amazing! Isn't she wonderful? Literally, they had a side event called Angel and Demons, where Sakura, Ino, and Tenten are the demons, quote unquote, while Hinata is portrayed as a sweet, innocent little angel. It's things like that that piss me off. You don't have to make the other girls look bad to make Hinata look good. That just... that doesn't make me like Hinata more. It just makes me annoyed. It's part of the reason why I don't follow the series as much as I used to. The Hinata favoritism got really out of hand. I even looked on TV tropes. They literally allow entries that bash soccer to oblivion, but they will never allow an entry to paint Hinata into a bad light. And if you do, you're the one inserting blatant falsehoods about the character. Look at this. Kishimoto's page on TV tropes is literally nothing but people saying that he hates Sakura and loves Hinata, and that's just not true. He doesn't hate Sakura. If anything, he was puzzled by why Sakura got so much hate. So he thought of how to raise her popularity and he focused on drawing her... pretty? Ugh. Yeah, that's a little suspicious to me. He knew Sakura got a lot of hate, but yet he didn't know the reason why? I'll tell you straight up, my only problem with Sakura is her stupid obsession with Sasuke, as I've repeatedly stressed, but other than that, she was fine. Unfortunately, she ended up marrying her would-be murderer and abuser. Now, let's look at this objectively. Do I believe Kishimoto wanted a Naruto and Sakura ending instead of what we got? There is some evidence that that's how things are going to go, but then plans changed. When and why is the question. At the beginning of the story, in Chapter 3, when Naruto is disguised as Sasuke to Sakura, he compliments Sakura on her forehead. That seems like a Chekhov's gun that was never fired. At the end of the story, Sakura has to find out that that was really Naruto, but she does not which is a failure on Kishimoto's part. Here's the thing about Shonen Jump. They may tell stories, but they are also a business. And what makes money for everyone is how many toys they sell, which is the purpose of everything ever made. I'm a Transformers fan, and part of being a Transformers fan is acknowledging that Transformers fiction exists so Hasbro can sell toys. The original cartoon was literally a 20 minute toy commercial, <laughs> and if I ever did a Transformers retrospect I'd be in it for the long haul. What I suppose I'm getting at here is that it takes a long time to get a loyal and devoted fan base, and then it takes only one thing to shatter that fan base and divide it completely. What happened to the Naruto fan base after the ending is kinda of similar to what happened to Star Wars when The Last Jedi came out. That's all I'm gonna say on the matter because, holy shit, some of you people really need to get on with your lives. Then again, I guess I'm in no position to call out people who are doing Rise and Fall of Star Wars because, you know, I'd be a huge fucking hypocrite if I did, but that's another matter. The last was, from what I've heard, Japan hated the movie. Many reasons why. A big reason was the movie's false advertising. Before we even knew what the movie was about, they sold three pre-sale tickets. The three characters who were advertised were Naruto, Sasuke, and Kakashi, and I can tell you, two of those characters are barely in the movie. And here's the thing, before we analyze why people were so upset with the last, it's time for some history. Before Naruto's conclusion, for years, Naruto and Sakura was not treated like it was the red herring pairing in Japan, it was treated like it was the golden pairing. Whoever was responsible, they played up like it was something that was meant to be. The parallels were definitely something to be noted, particularly Minato and Kishina, which was absolutely meant to be a Naruto and Sakura parallel. There are two things that make up Naruto lore, Naruto Sasuke parallels and Naruto Sakura parallels. One of the themes of the story is that relationships repeat themselves throughout the generations, yet that didn't apply here for some reason. It's also most telling with the Naruto and Obito comparison. Kishimoto went to great lengths to compare the two. 
The most obvious was how Obito's love for Rin was a parallel to Naruto's love for Sakura, and now it's completely inaccurate. Also, Kashina's dying wish was for Naruto to find a girl like her, who Minato more or less confirmed was Sakura. Why was that dying wish not honored? Yeah, more on Kashina in a minute. On the other end of the spectrum, there was also some evidence of things not going this way. In chapters 539 and 540, Sakura is stalked by random love letter fodder, and Sakura turns him down because she already likes someone, and you'd think he would have left it ambiguous, but nope. Next chapter, he confirmed it was still Sasuke. <sighs> I've already talked about how little sense it makes for Sakura to still love him at this stage. People ask, why does Sakura love Sasuke? Better question is, why the hell should she? Kishimo's own logic of the situation was that Sakura should not move on from Sasuke lest she be a terrible woman. Yeah, in an abusive relationship, it be Sakura's fault for not moving on makes perfect sense. Now, I'm going to talk about Neji real quick. Neji's story in part one was great. He was part of an oppressive family. His entire fate, he wanted to fight against it. He was fought up to do nothing but die. When asked why he killed Neji, he basically admitted, To make Hinata into Naruto's heroine, I had Neji die so Naruto would go closer to Hinata. Neji died as a Cupid. Yeah, there you go. Neji didn't die because it would be a good ending to his character, but to force Naruto into marrying Hinata. Neji should be the page picture for Die For Our Ship because that is literally what happened. Ultimately, I thought the point of Neji was that he was going to change the Yuga clan for the better with Hinata, but by showing panels of Neji's grave, the underlying message is ultimately that the Yuga clan didn't change for the better. Naruto failed that promise. The whole situation got muddy when in July 2012 the film Road to Ninja was released, which was very much a pro Naruto Sakura movie. So why was that movie followed up with something like The Last, which was in favor of Naruto and Hinata? Well, that leads credence to the idea that Studio Pro was just as divided on this issue as the fans were. Now, here's the thing about Shonen Jump and popularity. Popularity makes the world go round in Shonen. It's why Broly became canon recently. Another note on that, Broly had a divisive reputation among the Dragon Ball fanboys, but the movie made him a much deeper, more interesting character. Now, why could Kishimoto not do that with Sakura? He apparently claims he's not good with writing female characters or romance. Maybe that's why Samurai doesn't seem to have female characters at the moment? That's one way to do it. Do I think it was a business decision to go with Naruto with Hinata over Naruto and Sakura? I imagine that had something to do with it. There's no doubt they decided to go with what they thought would make them more money in the end. Sasuke and Sakura happened as the after effect of going with Naruto and Hinata, and Kishimoto obviously had no idea how to make that look good, so I have suspicions that he made it as shitty as possible as a sort of revenge. Now, assuming it is true that he wanted a Naruto Sakura ending, maybe the part where Sakura gives Naruto CPR was his sly way of doing a Naruto Sakura kiss. He apparently had to look away when Naruto and Hinata kissed in the last, but he had no problem drawing Naruto and Sasuke kissing. Yeah, Sasuke was Naruto's first kiss deal with that, shippers. They decided to go with Naruto, Hinata, and Sasuke Sakura as a sort of idea of appealing to those shits, but they couldn't forget about those who wanted Naruto with Sakura or Naruto with Sasuke, hence why they gave Naruto a son and Sasuke a daughter. This way they could say, hey look Naruto Sakura and Naruto Sasuke shippers, their kids might get together! Which only further proves that the only reason Naruto and Sasuke didn't end up together is because they're both boys, but I digress. What also motivated the pairings was that they wanted to make sequels, hence why Naruto hasn't been shown to fix everything. As I've stressed, this is the problem with sequels. It's like what happened with Star Wars. The story was wrapped up nicely in Return of the Jedi, but when Disney decided to make a sequel trilogy, they just had the Empire come back as the First Order, but that's another story. So thus, the Boruto manga opens with Konoha destroyed and Naruto seemingly dead. I don't believe for a second that he is dead, but yeah, sure. But let's imagine, Sakura and Hinata's place during the scene where Naruto basically ruins What's-Her-Name's birthday party. In the film, Hinata just stands there and looks sad while Boruto yells at her about his dad. But if Sakura was in Hinata's place and Naruto did something like this, she would probably have gone over to Naruto herself and just said, Hey, CUT THAT SHIT OUT! Yeah, problem solved. The reason why I think Sakura probably should have ended up with Naruto instead of Sasuke has to do with a lot of basic ideas. Around Naruto, Sakura can act like herself. 
Every time she's with Sasuke, she reverts back to a fragile flower. For example, the part where she asks what's going on and he's cold to her, instead of doing anything constructive, she just stands there and acts like a kicked puppy. This leads me into the part where Sakura wakes up while Naruto and Sasuke are fighting. This is why I have such a problem with Kakashi. He should have done something about Sakura throwing herself at Sasuke. Sakura needed a moment where she put Naruto before Sasuke. Kakashi should have sat Sakura down and asked her some hard questions. Why do you love Sasuke? He has treated you poorly. He clearly doesn't return your feelings, so you need to focus on something that makes you happy. Who makes Sakura happier? I think it's Naruto. She smiles around him. She acts like herself around him. As for Hinata, well yeah, there was the love confession which Naruto didn't acknowledge in any way for the rest of the series, oddly enough. The last explanation for why he didn't respond was because he didn't know the difference between loving a person and loving food was... really stupid. Based on his expression, yeah, he knew damn well what she meant. Yet another reason I despise that movie. Uh, see, when Sakura hugged Naruto, Hinata had a very interesting expression. It's obvious she wasn't entirely happy, but if Naruto and Sakura did end up together, I think Kishimoto would have had Hinata be happy for them. As for what to do with Hinata, well, I think a better ending for her would have been the show that she took over the Hyuga clan and then freed Neji from his curse and they ruled the Hyuga clan together, making for a much better ending to that plot than, oh hi Neji's grave, here's my daughter who was born because you died, thank you! But on to other matters, what about Kashina, Naruto's mother? Well, in February 2014, when Kishimoto was asked if any characters were based on people he knew in real life, he said that Kashin was based a little bit off his wife. Then, just before The Last was released, Kishimoto said that Kashina was a red herring. Hmm, I find that suspicious. What was also really telling was in October 2015, Kishimoto was interviewed by Anime News Network while he was in New York. Kishimoto mentioned that his own wife was upset that Naruto didn't marry Sakura. In fact, she complained quite vehemently. He tried to defuse the situation by assuring her that she was based on Hinata, but the truth of that was that he was bullshitting her to try to calm her down. The interviewer pieced two and two together, that his wife was like Sakura, and that was really telling to me. That would seem to suggest that it was a case of outside pressure and lack of commitment by Kishimoto. Hmm, that paints everything into a darker picture. See... The truth may be that Sakura wasn't just some girl he planned into the story. No, she was his wife. And he abandoned her. Left her to rot. He lost his belief in everything. He stopped caring about his story. The series may have ended in 2014, but mentally Kishimoto had already exited the series long before that. When the series began, when Naruto expresses his dismay at the ninja system and how he wouldn't appeal to the system and be a ninja in his own way, you could look at that as Kishimoto being a young, aspiring artist seeking to challenge the Shonen Jump system, and to put it bluntly, he lost. Shonen Jump responded to the backlash by trying to say that Sasuke and Sakura were always meant to end up together. I remember there was a commercial that had Sakura express anger how Hinata was now the heroine instead of her. Recently, there was a picture of Naruto's bonds, and guess who wasn't pictured? So, they've pretty much just erased Sakura from everything. In fact, they seem outright proud of it. She's also the only member of Team 7 not in Jump Force. Although, I haven't played the game as of this recording, but maybe that's a good thing based on what I've seen of that game. The last was hyped up to be a movie about Naruto and Sakura's parting and Naruto and Hinata's coming together. That they would go their separate ways after the movie? But I thought that wasn't what Naruto was supposed to be about. It was supposed to be about treasuring your bonds. Yet it made a lot of people think that their bond was destroyed. The way they worried it made it seem like Naruto and Sakura would never be friends after the movie. You know what? Fine. After the movie, they're not friends anymore. Am I overreacting? Probably. But that's how I see it. After the last, Naruto and Sakura are no longer friends, and might as well never have been. In the end, really what I think happened is this. For a series that preached never give up, love over hatred, outside, behind the scenes, it was hatred that won. Those people who hated on Sakura got everything they wanted. Liking Hinata is fine, 
But let me stress something, Hinata's game should not have been at Sakura's expense and it felt like it was. The fan base was forever divided by the ending of the last. Ironic for a series that preached about bonds with people you know. While certain people were happy about the conclusion, others were not so happy, and betrayed, and slapped in the face, and they may never win that trust back. Maybe Kishimoto was just guilty of ironically enough not understanding people. The whole thing now serves as a lesson of how sometimes some ships don't sail, but maybe sometimes they should've.